Good morning. Good afternoon, rather. Do I? Okay. I don't have any way to get everyone's attention, and I can't whistle, so. All right. Welcome to our work session of February the 26th. We'll go ahead and um, have the invocation by Pastor Guy Glass. No. Yes. And then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd stand, please. Would you please take a moment and bow with me in prayer? Father God, once again, I am standing before you, before those who have been ordained by you and elected by the people of this community to serve this community, and those who live in this community to offer a prayer for wisdom, discernment, discretion, and kindness, so that what was ultimately worked on today would be accomplished in this meeting by your grace, dear God. We remind ourselves today that it is you who have established this government, and thus it is in a position that they are your servants to these elected officials as they conduct this meeting. I pray for your enlightenment, your direction, and your encouragement, and your action, so that first and foremost, that all that is done here would honor you, which will then produce decisions, resources, and commitments, which will have a positive effect on those who live within the boundaries of what is accomplished here. May you give these commissioners the humility of heart to embrace with gentleness and generosity those whose actions this day will be affected and they are serving. May each person here, whether they are here to work on county business or to speak to a community issue, uh, desire to hear these words in their heart that would be your response, well done, good and faithful servants. To this end I pray, amen. Amen. Commissioner Bellamy, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? <laughs> allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> oh, I won't, I'm not done. <laughs> no, uh, Commissioner Bellamy, I'm not done either, just so you know. I, I am. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Okay, let's see, on the agenda items today, um, Jerry, would you like to take over, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Jerry Lopez, Director of Redevelopment and Economic Opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, um, commissioners and um, all of those um, listening in. Uh, as you know, back on um, April 15th, we presented um, an update of our affordable housing initiatives um, that generally we call our all things housing, uh, just all things housing. Um, so we had that work session and um, we went through and uh, did a lot of work that day, but we did not um, get all of our work accomplished. So that's why we're here as our part two uh, to continue on um, with several of the items that we did not get to finish. Um, just as a recap, we reviewed um, at that April 15th meeting, our current housing market, we looked at some statistics for supply and demand, and we looked at some of our accomplishments over the last um, three years. Uh, in addition, we requested guidance on our local housing assistance plan, our affordable housing advisory committee recommendations, and our surplus property for sale uh, to for-profit developers for affordable housing. So I just wanted to real quick just go through the outcomes of that meeting and what we have been doing just to recap before we get to our, um, our two topics for this afternoon. With our local housing assistance plan, we went before the board on April 20th, um, and that was approved, and two key items uh, were in that uh, report, and that was increased sales price maximums, as well as increased levels of assistance to um, per households to be able to respond uh, to increased costs and what we're seeing in the market. That report has gone up to the state, and we are waiting for approval. The second one was our affordable housing advisory committee recommendations. Um, you discussed the utilities department and um, their 
uh, rate reduction for those direct connect fees. Um, that will be coming part as part of the budget process and the rates discussion that you will be having. Um, so you'll be seeing that in the next several months. Um, the LDC density clarifications, um, that's also underway in terms of um, staff work and then through the process that will be happening, um, we believe, by uh, early fall. Um, the third one was just general policy direction about um, holding uh, for BADS, holding fees until certificate of occupancy and our tree protection trust fund, and, and that work is also underway. For the surplus property, um, property management provided that inventory of all the list of the surplus properties um, that have been reviewed by staff between December and April. Um, we have worked with property management to identify um, those properties for that affordable housing list that's suitable for affordable housing, and that will come before the board on June 8th. So we'll discuss that item then. Uh, and lastly, there were some additional discussion items that the board had um, that um, do remain um, to be brought back to you, um, and those include uh, impact fees and some regulatory barriers such as parking ratios and some of the processes for density bonuses. So we will not cover that today. That will be on a separate items coming up. So what are we coming today? What are our targets for today? So the two areas that we do want to receive guidance on today is our a proposal for an expanded down payment assistance program. This is for our Southwest District, our redevelopment area using our TIF funds and to be able to prioritize our essential service workers and veterans. That's the first topic. And the second one is our pilot project to explore the use of a community land trust. I'm going to turn it over to Denise Thomas, our community development manager, and she's going to walk you through um, our uh, down payment assistance program. Denise? Good afternoon, Denise Thomas, Community Development Division Manager for Redevelopment Economic Opportunity. I want to thank you for this opportunity to come before you and talk about an exciting program that I think will be very beneficial for Manatee County. In an expanding, robust market, there's a continual need for the American dream of home ownership. For many, the struggle for home ownership is in finding the resources to make their mortgage payments more affordable. Many homeowners can afford a monthly mortgage payment, but may not have the resources to pay all or a portion of the down payment and or closing costs needed to consummate the transaction or to be able to realize long-term affordability with a lower first mortgage. So today we would like to bring before you in consideration of this and because of the need for down payment in an aggressive buyer's market, we sat back and we looked at what is going on within our communities and what the needs are and we became creative in looking at another tool that would bring opportunity for home ownership, especially in light of the increases in property values and sales prices. Over the past few years, down payment assistance has predominantly been funded through the SHIP program, which is provided by legislative appropriation through the Sadowski Trust Fund. Since our last work session, the state legislation approved their budget and established a floor for the Sadowski Trust Fund, whereby we will receive a minimum of one-third of what is collected in the trust fund. Now, this is good news because at least it established certainty, certainty of what we will receive on an annual basis. However, it still is not enough. It's not enough to meet the demands of our community in realizing home ownership in a fastly changing environment. So based on stats for the Southwest District, Homeownership rates have decreased slightly from 2019 to 2020, and it's almost 10% lower than the county as a whole. Through the establishment of this program, it is our goal to stabilize and improve homeownership rates within the Southwest District by encouraging essential service personnel 
and veterans to purchase homes within the Southwest District. Even though these income levels that you see would be utilized in the implementation structure of this program, which is called, which I love, the HEROES program, the program, this particular strategy will be handled separately and apart from the SHIP program due to the geographic boundaries for the program. And as you see, these are the income levels for 2021. They have gone up just a little bit, but they are um, what are the parameters that we work with with our other programs. The thought process for this program is that we wanted to focus on those individuals that make our life easier. Our frontline employees, those who keep us safe day after day, those who educate our children, those who provide for our health needs and day-to-day -day needs, but also those who put their life on the line for our country so that we can maintain our freedom in America, our esteemed and beloved veterans. This program, called HEROES, will serve households at 120% area medium income and below. It will provide for a 30-year mortgage deferred loan at 0%. Income qualifications will be based on total household income similar to the SHIP program. Individuals interested in attaining the down payment assistance must qualify for a first mortgage with one of our certified lenders with an interest rate that does not exceed three quarter percent over the Fannie Mae, Fred and Mike 60 day yield for the 30, 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And we do determine that. We look at the yield, we look at the pricing and we ensure that, and this is to avoid any predatory lending to ensure that they're getting a feasible and reasonable rate. Individuals will be required to attend and complete one of our home ownership educational classes because an educated buyer, buyer will make better choices. And they will also be uh, have to purchase a home within the Southwest District, which is the TIF District. And the maximum sales price should not exceed that that's been established under the Manatee County 2021-24 Local Health Assistance Plan that you recently approved. These are the approved sales price limits and level of assistance that was approved by the board that will be provided under the Manatee Heroes Down Payment Assistance Program. As a pilot, we are recommending to the board uh, in consideration 500,000 from the Southwest Dis District Tights Increment Financing or Southwest TIF Fund to initially implement and determine, and through this, determine the interest and effectiveness of the program based on the current market conditions. In order to set this in place, we will need to bring this before the board uh, as a budget amendment for fiscal year 2021 to be implemented uh, immediately or as part of the budget process uh, amendment for next year, whichever the board should choose. Staff in turn will prepare a resolution for the board adoption and establish procedures for implementation of the program and follow any further guidance uh, that the board deem necessary for establishment of the program. We truly want to thank you for just considering this program. We want to thank you for considering Manatee Heroes. They reside in Manatee County, and hopefully we'll be able to bring the American dream into a community and also see those individuals, which will cause some retention within the job market, and help to build up that community, Southwest District community. Again, we don't want to thank you, and if you have any questions, we'll take any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. It's a good. Thank that you. That was very good. Yes. Um, Commissioner Whitmore, just a couple questions. So uh, this money, the down payments, 
up to 500,000 will be coming out of the Southwest TIF. Yes, ma'am. So will the housing have to be located within the Southwest TIF? Yes, ma'am. Well, that's what I assume because of the yes, parameters. Okay. It would. What, so what about um, our residents that live, uh, you know, North County? In other out, areas? Out east, yeah. Okay, currently we have within our prior ship funding right, as right. well as our community development block grant funding. <laughs> We have 300000 out right now under the Community Development Block Grant, and we have 238000 which was program income we received through the SHIP program, out as well. So everyone can be helped, but we use this part for that area, but also for everyone else. They In have other access. Words, we've spread it out more yes, money where we've got 800000 versus 300000 yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, ma'am. Perfect. Yes, okay, ma and then um, the just so... so the very low income, the sales price would be 180000 and they would be uh, qualified. We would uh, contribute 45000 Yes, ma'am. Now, I know we've talked about this before, and I know we're getting into this later. Is that, that follows the, the property, right? And, and so, like, let's say that person moves or passes away, the family can go in. Is this what, is this? What I'm talking about, I mean, how does it, once we help, how do we make sure it okay. still stays affordable housing? There will be a 30-year mortgage lien okay. that will be recorded against the property. As long as they reside in the property, should they sell, lease, vacate the property, then it becomes due and payable. But only the amount of assistance we provide it. But it is for 30 years. We do allow if the individual should pass that a family member or family heir can come in and assume the loan under the same terms and conditions. And is this veterans or was another? Priority would be given for essential service personnel and veterans. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of questions and some thoughts. Um, one, we're putting up this down payment. It looks like approximately 20%, depending on where you come in. Do we require any equity to go in behind us? Or are we providing 100% of the down payment? We only asked them to invest $500 into the transaction, but they usually invest more because they have to pay um, initial deposit mm -hmm. or they may have to pay, you know, for their appraisal and credit <clears throat> report up front. Okay, so they do actually, have some investment in that, it. That, that was the second part of that same question. So <clears throat> we don't come in until they're ready to close. We're not we're not fronting the diligence closing costs, right. and it turns out Correct. the bank declines them at the last we're minute. We're at the so. very end of the transaction. Okay. They have to go through a first, first mortgage loan approval. They have to get a sales contract on a property. we at the very end. When they get to us, they're about ready to close. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, next question. We're, we're requiring a lien, you said. So I'm assuming this is a, a, a junior lien behind a mortgage. Is that why we have them using our specific banks because uh, not every bank is going to allow a second mortgage behind themselves. Most banks do that we deal with, but the reason that we, we deal certify with. Okay. the lenders is that we want to, un we have them go through a three hour um, training with me. And it's basically to impress upon them that you're working with our constituents. We want them to understand the process. And they also are the ones who submit the packages to us. So we take them through a rigorous training to ensure that they understand the parameters of the program, what is needed, and we also evaluate them along the way to make sure they are given the customer service that we want because this is a big decision for an individual, and we want to make the process as smooth as possible. So we do have a training for lenders they have to attend, and we go through the whole thing. We even quiz them along to make sure they understand what we are telling them to ensure that they know the program and will give the best service in the community. Okay. Because <clears throat> I, I do have a bunch of questions. Uh, next, uh, when we have the second mortgage, do we have a right to cure on that with the senior? I mean, are we protecting the money we're putting in? Can we... Right to cure? What is cure? That right to cure, meaning if, if, they, if they don't pay the senior, if they don't pay their mortgage, then that mortgage could theoretically wipe us out in its entirety. Do we have a right to step oh. in and either take over the collateral? Do we have the ability to, to take over the property if necessary or at least cure them relative to paying that payment to keep it whole? Our amount within the transaction is pretty much small compared to the first mortgage. Usually when uh, there is a foreclosure or something that we do try to get 
all or some of our funds back, but it depends on how the foreclosure sale go and what is remaining. We have recapture, and in fact, last year, we didn't get any SHIP funds, but we received over 500,000 program income just from recapturing money from transactions that occur. Okay. Um, you mentioned this, this HEROES program associated with this. When I look at the, the averages that we're putting in there between thirty and 45000 with $500,000, we're really only talking about helping maybe 10 to 15 people. Um, do, do we feel uh, I'm not saying, do we feel it's a pretty broad list? I mean, I understand what, when we had COVID here, but we're including tourism industry people, food service people. I'm not saying they're not part of retail workers. That's a vast majority of the people working in Manatee County. It almost feels like, it, it's one thing if you're helping 10,000 people, but if we can only help 10 to 15 people, don't, don't we think things like police, fire personnel, Things <laughs> that nature or it should probably be near the near the front of the line when we have such a limited pool of funds to deal with. That seems like we're being so broad in terms of who we're helping in the Manatee Heroes down payment assistance. Right. That is a very good question. You as the board can decide who you want to prioritize and who you want it to target. We're here to listen. We're here for your guidance. All right. <clears throat> Next question. I'm sorry, it's a bunch of them. I just wanted to clarify. Um, in the heroes, you mentioned Manatee County School District. Have we spoken to the school district about maybe jointly working with us on this? I mean, you would think it'd be their best interest to maybe go 50 50 on some of these down payment assistance for their teachers. It could be a recruitment tool for them, basically saying, we're willing to come in at $20,000 for down payment. If you come in at $20,000, let us get a couple of teachers in here and help put them in homes. I mean, it seems like a pretty good opportunity for them. We will be glad to have that conversation. We did present this program before the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee and Charlie Kennedy was there. So that is an excellent idea. We'd be happy to speak with them so that they can partner with us to ensure that we're able to help our educators. Gotcha. Okay. And the very last thing I promised, and this isn't really a, a question, it's more of a, a thought and people can do with it what they want. And this is going to involve, I don't see Jan here, but it would be an we have a ton of money and in investments. I mean, I love down payment assistance. I think it's a great use. I mentioned the other day that, you know, one of the best things you can do is keep someone in a house and, and you know, as opposed to, you know, and, and people who are using this are people who qualify for a senior senior mortgage. They typically have a job. They've got decent credit. I mean, that's how they're getting their mortgage in the first place. These are the kind of people we want to get in houses and keep in Manatee County. Uh, we've got tons and tons of reserves just sitting around in investments making nothing like 1% and change. Um, have we ever considered taking some of that, those investment funds, instead of doing 0%, I'm saying, what if we did this at the same 20%, I mean, you could do it even at 30% because it gives us even more protection, and did it at, say, 1% or 1.5%, very cheap from an equity standpoint, lower than what their mortgage is, and use this almost as an investment tool of our capital because instead of investing it in a mutual fund making 50 basis points someplace, we can be investing it in citizens of Manatee County and, and forget 500000 We can do $5 because we've got $100 million sitting in investment accounts making nothing. We can make more money charging 1% on this with real collateral behind it. And instead of putting 10 to 15 people into a house, we put 100 to 150 people into a house. Mm -hmm. And it's accretive to our overall investment portfolio and accretive to Manatee County as a whole. We ever considered that, using this more as an investment tool to get a return for ourselves while putting even more people into houses? Well, all I can do is talk from history, especially being with the county for 25 years. We did at one time impose the interest rate, and we had to bring on the servicer, which you got to pay them as well. Um, what we found is because our lien was smaller than the first mortgage, a lot of people forgot about us, and they forgot to pay. And then, and then we had the servicer trying to go after the people to get them to pay, <coughs> and the challenge was is what I have seen over the years, because we provide a deep subsidy and we do provide it at 0%, mm -hmm. we have less foreclosures that occur because the mortgage payment is still comfortable even in the midst of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
we have less foreclosure and impact. But we do recapture the money. Should they sell, lease, or transfer, they have to pay it all back, and it goes back to have another family. Oh, I know. That's why I'm saying it makes sense, because we can keep reusing the same $5 million yes. over and over and over again. Yes. But have we even looked at maybe having the ability, and I don't know, I'm not an expert in real estate taxes, and ever, but I know CDDs can put their their fees right onto a real estate tax bill. Why would we even need to bother from a servicer standpoint of collecting this one nominal 1%, which is nothing, you know, when we can just, couldn't we potentially maybe work on just having it factored right into a tax bill, like a CDD or an assessment. And then just once a year, we collect our nominal 1% on whatever our down payment assistance is. And then we just true up on the tax bill at the end of the year. That, that's probably a little above my pay grade, okay. but the board can make the determination how they okay. want to handle it. And this may that. be outside the scope, but just something. I'm, I mean, I, I love down payment assistance. Good, we've, got, good. we've got the money. We're not doing anything with it anyway. Mm. This seems like a good use of it. And if we're making 1%, we could easily make the argument that we're just netting out our, our investment portfolio anyway. Um, just neither here nor there, but something to think about. And it could even be incorporated into the Franks over here. Uh, Maybe we could take some of these houses, dump them into the community land trust later, and then do it that way. Okay. It sounds like a great question for Jan Brewer yeah, and Angel. Like yeah, okay. you're right. Yeah. KVO, Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm a, I'm a realtor, member of the association. Um, certainly I would benefit, actually, I've... I've ask the county attorney before this comes to a vote to bring an opinion on whether or not I can vote on this. Uh, because certainly, well, if you could potentially profit off of your vote. I mean, I, I've already sold one of the existing, <laughs> one, of the ex one to the existing program. Uh, well, thank you. And actually that same person that I sold it to is relisting, so I'm making money off of it yet again. But anyway, here and there. You would think that as a, you know, I'm sure my members, friends in the association won't be pleased with my position here, but I see this, it's, it feels good and it's well intended uh, as oftentimes things are and it does target something that is an issue within our community, of course, which is affordable housing. However, this is, you know, we're looking at a lot of money. We're, we're talking about um, $45,000 that we could be loaning someone with zero interest. Um, that's a lot of money. This is, this is growing government, and you're exposing tax dollars to risk. I'm concerned about the fact that we don't really hold a position when it comes to foreclosure and getting our funds back. Real estate valuation is very high right now, so if, you know, it shouldn't be too hard to imagine when I ask you all to imagine uh, a real estate crash where these valuations come tumbling down and you have foreclosures, and then you know, we've loaned $45,000 on a $200,000, whatever it is, $180,000 property that's now only worth, you know, $105,000, which could easily happen. Um, so we, we don't really have a position to get our money back. And this is money that we didn't make any interest off of to begin with. Um, so that, that should be a concern. I mean, we should learn the lessons of the Great Recession. And uh, it's not that I don't want to help people. That's not what I'm saying. It's that I don't know that... Um, you know, government handouts, even though I understand we're supposed to be getting the money back and likely we will, uh, and you certainly hope that you will, that people are good intended and, and that they will pay you back. But if people do stop paying, we don't really have the ability to foreclose here. We're not in a position um, to foreclose on these properties. And, and that's the way I'm understanding it. And if there is a foreclosure down the road, if the valuation isn't there when the property is sold, we're not going to get our money. We're not first in line. So the, these are some things that concern me that I think we, we really need to think about. Um, is this the proper role of government? And you, you hear me say that kind of quite frequently. Um, I do think that, you know, the government wants to create an environment in which, you know, working folks are able to afford, um, you know, adequate housing. I don't think that that means taking tax dollars from some citizens to, you know, give it, however be that temporarily, to other citizens to enable them and then you also run into the situation of how much skin does, do these folks have in the game at that point? They have some, but I don't know. When I went to real estate school and they taught me how to sell a house, one of the things they taught me was you wanted to target people with money because it takes money to buy a house. It's hard to get around that. Um, you, know, you, you have to have that sort of skin in the game. And um, I think that we're sort of taking that aspect out of this and that concerns me. You've done a great job putting this together. It's 
it just comes down to a, an issue of philosophy and whether or not this is the proper role of government. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it is. So I just want to, to my fellow commissioners, you know, put those thoughts out there and sort of just pump the brakes a little bit here and think to ourselves, is this what we want to be doing with tax dollars and, and even other side arguments? You know, I like where Commissioner Cruz is going when he says, you know, should we prioritize certain professions or segments of society? Over, but now government's picking winners and losers with tax dollars. So it just sort of opens Pandora's box. And there's a lot of, you know, potential unintended consequences here that I think we really need to take a long pause and think about before we, we act on something like this or get too far down the rabbit hole. Um, so sorry to sort of rain on the parade, but I just wanted us to play devil's advocate for a minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got a couple of more commissioners and Dr. Hopes on the board, but just wanted to let everybody know that Jan Brewer has, she's in the building, so you know, she's, she's here. So anything that comes up, she's here now. Uh, and the other thing is, is a question that I would have on it. You know, I, I think it's a great idea if it's safe, because it is taxpayers' money. Uh, but the other thing is, do any other counties, other counties in the state of Florida do that, I think would be a great question. Anyway, moving on. Dr. Hopes. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'd like to go back to, uh, it was either a comment or a question that uh, Commissioner Whitmore had. Uh, for example, um, somebody's living in Palmetto and they find a house down in the southwest area, they would be eligible because they're going to be moving to the southwest area, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. I just want to make that, that clear that... Yes, sir. Right, right, right. So if there are more funds available in one part of the county than another, anyone's welcome to, to move into that area and set up residence and send their kids to schools. And yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I walked in late. My last meeting ran late. Um, Great discussion. I, I love what the commissioners and Dr. Hope have, have said so far. Uh, and I'm glad Jan Brewer is here because I think well, you can come up if you want, but I think what you're going to tell us is maybe those investment dollars are already targeted for something else, and I'm not sure we can target them. For, oh, oh, well, you will. Um, <laughs> we'll let her answer it. Um, and I think, Kevin, you're going to love the community land trust because there, we have lien rights in a community land trust. So that kind of solves your problem. Okay, my question is about um, using money out of the South, Southwest TIF. Um, and I don't have a problem in doing that, but um, uh, I just wonder, is that, do you foresee that changing? Is, the, is that still gonna be needed as a resource now that the Sadowski Fund has some certainty to it that we're gonna get a certain dollar amount in ship funds? Do you, do you see that as a positive and are we gonna, be able to rely on that? The one thing that we were that was shared to us by the state that even though there is certainty, it's based on collections. So if collections is low, it could go down. Collections is high, it could go up. So we don't know where that fine line would be from year to year. We thought about this program before we knew what the legislation was going to do, but we also are hearing out there that individuals still having issues with trying to buy housing with the rising cost. And it's not that they don't have a good job and pay, they just don't have the reserves in order to do the down payment to bring it down to an affordable level so that they can sustain it regardless of what the market does. So that was one reason why we looked at this. There are other communities that do uh, programs for um, the cop next door or the teacher next door, different programs. The state encouraged us to look at essential service personnel so that we can keep the retention and keep those individuals within our communities to serve our, our constituents. So that was one of the reasons. How this would go, this is the first time the legislation has done it. Yeah. And we don't know how it's going to look. Well, I guess the good news is it's such a hot market right now in Florida, yes, it and it probably will be, at least in the short term, and some people project for a few years or longer. Um, and so, and I guess we can probably count on the Sadowski funds to be there as described for the next four years, because the leadership coming on at the legislature has said, we're on board and we're going to do this. But you're right. After that time, it could change. But I say... 
take advantage of it, right? We need to start planning because there's a good amount of money coming this way. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Again, if I could add, um, a lot of the, the ship requirements have different levels of assistance where some has to go towards low income. Uh, so, and then some is for new construction as opposed to existing. So those percentages change. So the amount that we can allocate to it does change a little bit. That's why we wanted to look at some of this additional funding. Also to meet some of the goals of the Southwest District, and that really is to to stabilize part of the, the tax base a lot since we're seeing some of that home ownership rates go down, which means that there's a lot more rentals in terms of trying to stabilize that tax base. This was a way to get investment, you know, in home ownership from residents that are going to be there and be invested in these neighborhoods to to be there. So that's the other rationale to try to be using some of this money. And and as Denise said, this was really a, a pilot, just seeing, testing it out, see what happens. We just don't know what kind of response we'll get to gauge the interest to see how that matches up with sales prices, um, but that will give us a little bit more indication of what's really kind of going on with the homeownerships and so many residents are being squeezed and not being able to afford given all the rises in, in sales prices. Commissioner Whitmore. Before we go any further, I have to tell the board, I was thought about this all night. I just want to thank the board for yesterday on the code enforcement Leans that I and Misty can tell you, and, and Vanessa also, for years, you know, I've, I've fought the little battles and lost most of them um, on getting some of the fines. For a while, I lost everyone, and then they started easing up and getting tired of me pulling them. But I just want to thank you guys because these are people of no fault of their own, I feel, that government just, you know, got out of control. and. Now that we identified it yesterday, hopefully there's a process that, that we won't see these kind of situations, so I had to say that. But as far, you know, um, as, far as the, the loans, uh, what, what we're talking about today, I, I get, I understand um, Kevin's, uh, his, it's his philosophical um, way. This is how he believes, and that's totally fine. Um, but what I want to know from you, Denise, is... We get paid back. What's the percentage that we don't get paid back? I don't ever recall that number that we don't in all your years here. It's a small percentage because the individuals are still living in the homes. They, they don't buy and then usually go to another. They stay in those homes for a long time. You have to know the character of the individuals that we are serving. And once they get a home, that becomes like... Um, a family heirloom that they want to hold on to and hopefully pass on to their own children. It's kind of the only stability they have. Yes. So essential services, uh, when I hear this definition, I'm sure there's a formal definition, but when I think essential services, I'm thinking of like the restaurant, the waitresses, the bartenders, the, um, the, the people that are cleaning houses and the husband and wife have two or three jobs. That's the type of person I was thinking of that needed help. And the professionals, um, you know, the, the, the health care and the fire and all that, I understand that too. So I was thinking of, and, and the retail workers, you hit it. And, you know, tourism, you don't get paid a lot with tourism-related businesses. Uh, you know, and I know restaurant workers, they only get paid a certain amount of an hour, and then tips, so hopefully the tips is what get you over the edge. If you're on the island, you're probably making a fortune. If you're somewhere else in the county, maybe not as much. So I know I'm, I come from a different way of thinking. Um, this is a way to keep uh, our economy um, going. And personally, I didn't even own a house till 97 because I never could afford the down payment. And um, so I didn't care. I just paid my rent and let the landlord take care of everything if it broke. And that's how I worked. And then my husband, who would never rent it, said, absolutely not, we're buying. And, you know, tax credits and all this, so we did. But I was perfectly fine uh, renting. And, but this is important to a lot of people. It was really never important to me to own a house. It was important to me to have a house and, ha and be able to be safe and pay rent. Now, some of us come philosophically different. <laughs> But um, I own now, and I'm fine with that. But um, and we're all we're all good with that. But but there are some people that choose not to own, and then there are some that that 
that would love to, but can't afford it. And this is to help those people. The essential services, is that a legal definition, or is that what we use? <laughs> that is actually the definition in our local house and system. In our plan. Okay, got it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So anyway, I, I, I would like to help the underdog if I can, and no pain, no gain. I mean, uh, and I love growing this fund from 300000 to 800000 and maybe we can help more. Maybe there's more out there. We'll find out. Commissioner Cruz. <coughs> Two things. One's more just my opinion on something. We're, we're kind of pandering to our legislators up in Tallahassee. That Sadowski fund thing was ridiculously terrible. Um, as much as we want to pretend that the to, to thank you, to thank everybody for the crumbs they've they've provided us. Uh, <laughs> we were supposed to get probably what about four and a half million dollars this year. We're getting a million and change. Let's, let's all recall so all four and a half million dollars that came from this county. We, we want to talk about impact fees, dollar for dollar increasing housing costs, doc stamps, our taxes on every sale of every home in Manatee County, and therefore those doc stamps that they collected up in Tallahassee increased every home price, affordable and otherwise, dollar for dollar. They took it out of our county with a promise years ago to give it back to us. And now they're trying to say, after years and years of sweeping 100% of it, basically not giving us any money, effectively stealing our money while increasing the cost of our housing, they're now saying, if you accept this nominal 33% and shut your mouth, then we're all good. It, it was a terrible, terrible bill and plan. You know, they can deal with whatever they want to call stormwater, sea level rise with other people's money, not this money. It's ours. They're supposed to give it back. That's all there is to that. Uh, Thank you for acknowledging that taxation may, is theft. May, may, I, may I dialogue with uh, Commissioner Cruz? I've got several other I, I, commissioners I, I, I on the board, so you're going to have to wait. I'm sorry. Uh, on the, no, I, I was still going to say something oh, specific to what was that was just more an aside because it was mentioned that that we were so fortunate to get to get thirty three cents Evidently. on our dollar back. It's that's not exactly right. Servia, wait your turn, please. I will, it's only I will, fair Madam to everybody Chairman. else. I will. Apparently, yes, our major disagreements are Sadowski fun and parking. <laughs> <laughs> parking. And parking. No, what I was going to say to to Kevin as, as well as Carol. Carol. <laughs> was I, I think it's short-sighted to say we're, we're handing money out and it's not government's role. First off, I didn't say anything about handing money. I said, let's massively increase this and charge for it. If we're only going to get 1% on other investments, it's let's, let's take the, the free market role. Let's call it diversification. And we're just diversifying into a small nominal real estate portfolio <laughs> with our investment. And we're making the same return as we're making on all these other investment funds we have, but we're also helping Manatee County. The reason why this is important, and, and, and here's why. Renting, and I agree with you. I lived up in New York. I love renting. I, I've told Jess a million times I'd rather move into an apartment than live in a house. I can't stand it. But a lot of people like living in a house. There's benefits to people living in houses. Here's some benefits. It's, it's, a, it's known to be a health benefit, an education benefit. Someone who buys a house stays in the community longer. When they're in a community, they involve themselves in the community. The kids stay in the same school, so they're not bouncing from teacher to teacher, school to school, year after year. There, there, are, there are many benefits to putting people in houses. So it's not as just handout as you want to make it seem because, you know, if we can't attract teachers to Manatee County because they can't find a place to live, then they're going to go to Pinellas. Now our B-rated school system, which we want to be an A-rated school system, is going to become a C-rated school system. That's going to hurt everybody in this community. You think, you think Sharon Hillstrom is going to be able to attract new businesses to Manatee County with a C-rated school system? No. We want the teachers here. But if we just attract teachers and tell them to go rent someplace, every 12 months they can go someplace else. Because now they're just renting. All they got to do is pack up a few boxes and move up to Pinellas or DeSoto or Hillsborough or Sarasota and leave. We want them to be to be setting their roots in Manatee County, becoming part of the community in Manatee County. It's beneficial to everybody in Manatee County. So it's not as, as just selfless and handing out money as possible. That's why I, I fully support the down payment assistance. The more people we can get, especially these essential 
service providers to permanently live here and set roots, the better off this overall community is, the higher the everyone else's houses prices are going to be, the more higher wage jobs we're going to attract. It's beneficial to the entire community. And if we can do it by breaking even, by collecting some nominal amount to massively increase this down payment assistance amount, I am 100% for it. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Satcher and then Commissioner Bellamy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Jerry and team. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, not that I would ever be in this situation, but let's say your household size were to be eight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Eight. I, I think you would call the state. <laughs> it would be we, we eight would people, call so that'd be state. like six children and two adults. Are you right. talking about John and Kate? It's ridiculous. Um, John and Kate plus eight. So that'd be on page six, and uh, then it has the different uh, incomes there. And then on page nine, we've got the maximum sales price and assistance levels. My basic question is... Um, According to house size, does the amount that the program is able to assist a buyer change? In other words, if you're a household of two, it's a lot easier to find a house at $225,000 than if you're a household of eight, I would imagine. Um, so is there anything in that or planned or have you thought about that? <laughs> after, the, after the meeting. <laughs> and I won't be able to vote. <laughs> With this particular program, <laughs> it, it is however so you want it board. designed. With this particular program, I understand what you're saying. They may need a larger house because of a um, larger household. But if that's the board direction, that's where we will go. Okay. Um, okay, so that was just a basic question, <laughs> maybe a little self-serving. Um, <laughs> no, for understanding for the public, and it is something to consider. It is. Uh, you know, if you're a large, larger household, you're generally going to have to have, you're going to have more housing cost. Um, so maybe we could uh, work out something where um, maybe we don't go over that amount, but the house could be over that or whatever. Um, another question, I just wanted to let, for the people watching at home, um, just to go over real simply how the Southwest TIF, where the money in that fund comes from and how much approximately goes into that, um, you know, each year. So that's, I know that's a very general, you know, uh, overhead question, but I wanted to just go over that real quick. So overall, our Southwest District is um, unincorporated areas of the county south of Manatee Avenue, approximately uh, from uh, 301 all the way to the water down to university. So it is a very large area. Um, our collections, I, I don't have that number kind of off the top of, of my head. I don't know if, if Jan's back there, if she kind of has it off the top of her head. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, but the collections have been because property values have been increasing. That also is increasing. So um, it's the increment. So that tax base was frozen in 2014. So it's all of the additional new tax base from that time period till now. And um, but fifty percent of that is what goes into the trust fund that we then allocate to to different projects. Um, I do know the the number in reserves off the top of my head, but um, but the other numbers I don't have. What's the it. number in reserves? That's a good one too. You said you do know that. So with Social this Society? one, we had recommended taking the hundred the um, the five hundred thousand dollars from the reserves. We have um, about um, seven million in our catalytic projects piece. Um, some of that has been there's projects in the pipeline, um, but there is enough money in there to be able to allocate to that program. Sorry, Jan, didn't mean so, to put you on the spot. So since you were there, <laughs> right, right before uh, Jan speaks, let me. I'm going to put it in a way that makes sense to me, and then you just tell me if I'm completely wrong. Wrong. Um, so if in 2014 someone was paying their tax bill on a home and their home was worth $200,000, we froze that amount of taxes. That amount of taxes still goes into wherever it used to go before. If now that home is worth $300,000, we take the tax increase from the two hundred dollars to the three hundred. dollars the taxes on that, it goes into the Southwest TIF, but 50% of it becomes what you can use to help basically revitalize that area of the county. Is that correct? correct? Very good. Yes. Okay, great. 
Go ahead, Jan. What Okay, so sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, actually, right now, for the year you're in, seven million is going in from the general fund into the TIF, and then in the unincorporated area, it's giving about six hundred thousand into the TIF. So about a little over seven and a half million is going in there every year. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to make a general point since we're talking about things that we're considering going forward. Um, and so I think both of the, you know, commissioners, this is money. The money even that you're talking about in investments and uh, also the, the money, this is money that has already been collected and is in Manatee County possession. So we're not taking money directly from someone to choose a, you know, a winner and a loser. It's already there. If we want to change how much we take from the people, I have mentioned multiple times that I would love that conversation, uh, ways to take less. Um, but if we're going to take it anyway, uh, then we do need to come up. This should be on our list of smart things that could do that we could do with it. Um, so th that's just the point I wanted to make. I'm not necessarily... Um, I mean, competition is okay. They, they're making a case every time they're here that this is a great way to spend this taxpayer money uh, to help this area of the county. Um, you know, ultimately, that's, uh, that's a decision that was made previously by a board, and uh, we could revisit that. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, I think this is a, seems like a worthwhile thing. Um, so it, and it's worth... And if we're going to have this program, we might as well make the program useful. So if there are no houses and there is nothing to buy on the income levels and the assistance levels that we have set out, then what is the point, right? So if we're going to have this program, let's make it where it works. If we believe that the program overall, uh, that we have a better idea, uh, like giving the people, you know, taking less money from the, the entire county on their taxes, which is something, a conversation I'm willing to have, um, then we can have that conversation in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, I like I like where this where this is going, and we, it's, a board is always going to have you know philosophical differences. That's why you you make it up. Um, I'm, I'm with the um, assistant down down payment, and we definitely need to look into that. Um, my 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 thought on what I really want us to kind of make sure we revisit is this collaboration, this opportunity with the fifty fifty between the school district and the county. We really need to hopefully write that down, right, and find out how we can massage that and put it to work um, immediately, not eventually. Um, I, I find myself, you know, 20 years ago, you know, starting as, as a teacher, there's no way in the wor world, based on the average starting salary, someone's going to be able to afford the housing that's going on right now. But if we have a program where the school district can say, hey, this is what we can offer you, what it does, like Joe, Commissioner Cruz has said, it gives us the better, better tool to recruit more talent. And now that impacts, our, that, that impacts our school district, which obviously impacts our county, that school grade, all the things of that nature right there. And here, here's the question that I've had, that, that, that I have as far as um, where you're saying is a priority to essential service personnel and veterans, all right? So I want to separate the veterans look and, and ask, do we have a number as of right now? Man, he brought out a 10 to 15, and how can we get it to 10,000? I'm on your side. But <laughs> how can we identify how many veterans that we have impacted with programs or such as of right now? Do you have that information? No, I don't. No, you don't. We did have a conversation with Lee Washington when we were first talking about this and he says that he does have um, a couple veterans that he is working with that are interested in in home ownership so we would get names and and interest from from him from that well, regard and I but guess, i don't have a I, number I, I guess my question on that is you know we we have what we we have to offer and then how does the the va loan fit in with all of that or it doesn't Usually, VA loan is 100%, right. and it's guaranteed, so they may not need it. Okay. But this is the reason why I look at the level of assistance from being in the mortgage lending industry. Anytime you can get the loan to value at 80% or below, that creates less risk for the lender, and they look more favorably at those particular cases. 
When it gets up to 97 percent, it's considered a high-risk loan. So we're trying to reduce the exposure to give them more opportunity or possibly getting approved through a lender, which is realizing home ownership. The other question that you asked, we have been running this program since, 19, since I've been here in 1996. I know we have helped veterans along the way. They just, we just never asked that question because we want to help anyone and everyone. So I'm quite sure we have uh, helped a sizable amount of them throughout the years. But, I mean, if that's a question that you want us to identify as part of this program, we can on our application so that we can recognize. It's got to be distinguished as essential service personnel, so we're going to have something to document that. Right, right. And, and some of it might be a little self-serving also, since my dad told me he's going to put me out. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching it. No. <laughs> Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you. And I just want to follow up on the Sadowski Fund discussion. So I agree with you. The taxpayers have been ripped off since 2002. Please don't misunderstand what I said as pandering, because it's not pandering. Until the year 2020, okay, until... And okay. <laughs> well, here I want to share the good news because you know I'm the optimist always. So Galvano did such a good job for us. He's always been an advocate for affordable housing, and he convinced the leadership to keep the Sadowski Fund intact. And all indications were in 2020 that we were going to get that money, but the governor vetoed it. And that's when we didn't. What changed this year is Senate Bill, um, I wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget, Senate Bill 2512. And what that said is 50% cannot be swept anymore. It will be there, okay? So before Senate Bill 2512, we had 423 million in the Sadowski Fund that was potential for affordable housing. After Senate Bill 2512 this year, we will have $209 million secured and there. So, you know, just like the developers who come before us say, we need certainty, we need certainty, remove all the risk, we, mean, we have certainty. That's the good news. We can plan for that money. We're, Manatee County is set to get about $2.25 million. It's way more than we've ever received. So I'm trying to stay positive here. That's the good news. But to your point, yes, taxpayers were ripped off since 2002. It was a mighty shame. Now, the other good news is the emergency, the, the emergency preparedness fund that the legislator, le legislature approved this year. Because I think these guys can tell us that what would happen in the state of Florida is there would be a hurricane or some disaster, and FEMA will pay for it eventually, but you can't get the money right away, and you need the money right away. So where would they get the money? From the ship funds, yes. because it was available. Yeah. And then guess what? Then when they're reimbursed, you can't put it back in the ship fund. So because we now have a separate fund set up, that's going to preserve our ship funding. So there, there is a lot of good news that came out of this session, and I just want us to be able to plan for that because more money's coming. Thank you for the opportunity to follow up. And the only sad news is it's not enough money. Yeah. I know. Uh, Commissioner Van Austin Bridge and then Commissioner Whitmore. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going all the way back to Commissioner Cruz's comments earlier, um, what I was referring to the first time I spoke was the idea that staff is pitching, not the, the program that staff is pitching, not the idea that you threw out. Um, that's what staff is pitching a proposal here, right? A program? Pitching. pitching, yes. Proposing, a program they're proposing? Okay, all right. Um, and I'm not arguing uh, that there's not a need for workforce housing, uh, not, a, not at all. Just questioning whether or not this is the role of government. Uh, and uh, as far as home ownership, uh, I'm a realtor. You won't find a greater advocate for home ownership. Um, my concern is, you know, let me ask you this question. Why is it that lenders require borrowers to meet certain criteria in order for them to lend to them? And the answer is levels of risk. Um, so, you know, and to staff's comments about um, the character of, of folks who are wanting to borrow, of course they want to stay in their homes and of course they want to keep them forever. 
Uh, no one intends to get foreclosed upon. It, it's circumstances that are beyond our control, uh, loss of a job that you know leads to the loss of a home or an automobile or you know unemployment, that sort of thing. And it's usually the economy is things they can't control. Uh, and you know, it seems that I'm up here alone on this, on my side of this, of the fence, but, but that's okay. I, I just want you to understand that we're, we're looking and talking about lending money at no interest with very little recourse to high-risk borrowers at the absolute height of a real estate market. Thank you, Madam Chair. Com Commissioner Whitmore? Should I give the floor to George? No, I'll wait. <laughs> no. Um, I want to give a, uh, it's, it's actually going back to George, too. I want to give an example. Uh, you all know Ray Fusco. He, um, I was there the day his daughter was born. She's a teacher now. Uh, didn't stay here because our pay was the pits. So she went to uh, Hillsborough and Pinellas, and she worked as a teacher up there, and she moved up there. Well, thanks to, I guess, the sales tax or whatever, Whatever she got an increase. What are your starting? I mean, what are your teachers' rates? Fifty. Uh, currently, our beginning baccalaureate teacher salary is around fifty-two thousand a year. Okay, because when she started looking, and they get the summer the off and forty-five other days, and yeah. So she, so now she applied and she got a job last week back in Manatee County, where she was born at Manatee Hospital, but she can't find a house here. So she's still living in Pinellas, and a lot of our employees do that. Yeah, a lot. But so it's kind of what you said before, um, and I forgot how we got to the gist of that about, but we use teachers as an example, is this is an actual example that actually happened to me that somebody I know personally now has a great paying job in Mantee County but can't afford to live here. So, and she's a professional. She's got a BS degree, you know, and she's doing re very well and um, teaches special needs. So she's got a job at Brainton River, I think. I think that's where she's going. Um, I have a question about the um, TIF area. And I just started thinking about this. You know, when we started the TIF, uh, Lake Flores and Aqua by the Bay were ag, right? And that's their, what they're paying taxes on, correct? So to, and IMG, um, they've added a hotel. They bought some of White and Preston's ag land and, and built that hotel. And I think they bought another 100 acres because they were going to build a five-star hotel. So my question is, when we started the TIF, that ag property will always be that, what they pay, and um, that the difference will go to our TIF fund? Yeah. Yes. That's Whoa. the, at that level at 2014, that's the base. So that so, ag so, so all of the new development that's on top of it, all of that would be included um, so as part like of the So that's like 10,000 homes. So it will it will exponentially increase once all hotel. those projects start coming online. Oh my gosh. And then we got the mall, something hopefully will happen with that. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have great uh, and the um, commissioner Satcher the um, that the reserve that we've talked about you hear it's 7 million. And I know at one point people were freaking out. Well, we needed to have something in reserve so if an opportunity came to incentivize them and they could, you know, that's why we have that money's correct? Yes. <clears throat> That's what we call our catalytic projects fund. And like I said, we do have some projects in the pipeline. Um, so there, it's all still kind of being kind of worked through. But um, there's a little bit more as part of some of the other projects that we have. And that's a discussion that we can have kind of later as to yeah. some of the future projects for the using TIF money. And when you mentioned catalytic, I wanted to make sure that the public knew what that was because what the reserve was and why right. we were so doing that. So here we're talking about really large projects that have a real strong economic impact, whether it's with jobs and improving our, our tax base. Okay. Um, so we consider that at least a $15 million project or more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Denise, you cannot retire. I don't know if you're even in the hopper. <laughs> you just can't do it. <laughs> Please. Be a Charlie Hunsaker. Don't retire. Hope. <laughs> uh, yes, Madam Chair. Just I didn't want any of our uh, listeners to misinterpret um, Commissioner Cruz's comment about the school district risking being a C district. Uh, <laughs> you said the, that? Uh, the it. last year that the state graded school districts, which was the year prior to the COVID-19, um, we, the school district of Manatee County was one half a percentage point from an A district. Uh, 
hopefully for the first time in, in the history of Matthew County. Um, and hopefully if they do school grades, even with COVID, since we got most of our kids back in school, uh, we'll be in a district. I believe Commissioner Cruz's two children go to A rated schools in the school district of Manatee County. So um, we're, we'll never, I, I won't say never, because you know, you guys are having me go off, you know, a few days early and it might change the school district's grade, but uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Commissioner Satcher. Uh, I wanted to bring up, uh, I guess, piggyback off of um, what Commissioner Servia said. So if we have two and a half million slated for next year that's committed um, in the Sadowski funds, then this might be a good pilot for when that, those funds come in, that could be countywide, correct? We don't have to put that in district or in the Southwest District? That, that will be countywide, and it'll be based on the statutory uh, regulations that drive it. So well. we don't, uh, so we don't get to decide where how to use that. So we couldn't put that into a countywide heroes program. We would have to do whatever the state program is that they have. Well, what Jerry was mentioning, according to the statutory terms for the uh, ship program, um, sixty-five percent of the funds have to go to what home ownership. Seventy-five percent have to go to what construction activity. And 30% have to serve very low, 30% have to serve low. So you have to meet those statutory requirements. And I can tell you, the way we've been able to meet the 30% very low is through our rehab program, replacement program, which is taking existing stock for existing homeowners and bringing it up to code standard. So usually with the down payment program, it's usually the 80 and 120%, more than 120% that access it. But the SHIP program is designed truly for 80% and below. So we have those regulations that kind of keep us where we can't do all what we would love to do. Right. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Serbia. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give an example. I like that Carol gave an example. And I'll, I'll give you another one um, for my friend, uh, Commissioner Van Austinbridge. So um, we have all met Deputy Joy Jewett, right? We know the great work she does. She lives in um, Pinellas County because she cannot afford to get down here. She has six children, okay? She's a, obviously a responsible law enforcement person who has a good job and is secure and contributes to our economy greatly. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could get um, somebody like that, give them the little bit of down payment assistance to get into a place? So just think about the car travel on the road. Just think about that one person in that one car traveling and multiply it by thousands because we got this problem everywhere. The, the roadway congestion, it, it, it could help that too. And, and it just kind of snowballs. There are so many other effects on the schools as well. So I understand your um, risk aversion. Yeah, we all are. Nobody wants to lose our money. Um, and that's just a balance we have to strike, I guess. But what we do want to do is help the people who need help to get in a house that they deserve to live in, I guess. Those are my comments. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. So on the subject of risk aversion, Maybe a misspoke, um, but it's not our money. We're taking other people's money, but we're taking other people the responsibility of other people's money. Um, and I, I know you probably misspoke on that. Okay, um, for, she agrees for the record. Um, well, I wanted to get credit, you know, for correcting herself. That's all. Um, so it's not that I don't feel that people you know, should have an opportunity for home ownership. I absolutely do. I, you know, because of what I do for a living, I have helped more people achieve home, home ownership than anyone in this room. And I'm very proud of that. Um, the issue is that there's a certain path to home ownership that has to be followed. And, and part of that is having skin in the game. And I go back to, it, it takes some money to acquire a home. Uh, and everyone's life circumstances are different. I, I don't argue that one bit. I'm not saying that, it, I think that everyone deserves to own a home. So 
be clear on that. But also markets are cyclical and the market that we're in today is not the market we'll be in tomorrow. I couldn't you know, give houses away back in 2008, um, but, but now we're in a totally different situation. I mean, there was a point, and <laughs> not, not to be, make too personal, but you know, there was a point in 2006, right before the market crashed, man, I thought I was hot stuff. I was 26 years old. I had 21 listings on Anna Maria Island and thought, you know, this is really it. Uh, couldn't give them away. And there I sat and just acquiring listings and realized, you know, <laughs> this doesn't have the value I thought it did. And home values changed and prices came way down. Um, so it's an su- issue of supply and demand. Money is cheap right now. Um, so at, at any rate, that, that's just where I'm coming from. It's not that I'm, I'm arguing uh, whether or not people should be able to afford a home or, or, or should be able to have a home. I, I wish everyone could enjoy the American dream of home ownership. And I, if anyone is looking to achieve that dream, you can reach me at... Whoa, no, whoa. Uh, <laughs> no but, but seriously, I do help people achieve eh. home ownership, and I'm proud to do it. Um, so anyway, I just, I just sort of want to clear that up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, just to quickly clarify, you're saying there's risk. There's risk in everything we do. I mean, it, but by that logic, what we should do is take all of the taxpayer money that we need to hold in reserve, find the biggest Manatee County mattress we can find, and shove the money under there. That's the only way you're going to get a risk, <laughs> riskless, you know, use of this this money. That could that, be that, risky. That's not realistic. I'm not saying we be we become, you know. Calpers or something, and, and start putting money in like some of these pension funds do in you know SoftBank and, and VC funds, trying to get high yield returns. But we do invest it right now. We invest it in very risk adverse investments, which is why you know we get the one percent plus or minus kind of return on it. All I was arguing was we got the money anyway, sitting on it with zero percent return just loses endless value due to inflation. If we're using it wisely, yes, there is a little risk to it, but what's the trade-off to the risk? I'd rather invest that money with a little bit of risk here in Manatee County, which improves the overall county, than risk than invest it with slightly less risk someplace else. That's all I was saying is that there's good use of money. There's, there's investment for investment's sake, an investment in our community. I'd rather see it focused internally than externally. So I know we're at the top of the market, but this isn't a new program that no one's ever heard of before. This program is around at the bottom of the market, the middle of the market, the top of the market. You're just hearing about it now, and it happens to be the top of the market. This is not intended to be a program for the next 24 months till the next crash. It's a program that's intended for the next 24 years. It's going to be cyclical. You just happen to be hearing about it near the top of the market. And I hope you're advising all of your clients not to purchase homes because their equity is at risk due to the situation in the market today. That's fiduciary responsibility. (laughs) That would be a realtor client privilege as to how I advise my clients. uh, To try and hold down any problems here. (laughs) One thing that I don't know if the new commissioners know this or not, but... um, when Steve Johnson was on this board, he he actually went round and round with the clerk's office, with, with the, our clerk, on our investments because we were receiving such a low return on our investments. And we do, they're substantial, the investments that we have. It's, it's, it's huge. He did manage to get some of those changed, not many, but a few. So, you know... We can sit back and, and, you know, I'm kind of like I'm hearing both sides here. I agree with both of you. I think that since we're really not making any money on our investments, to think about trying to help the citizens have a better quality of life, that's a win-win. And I, I, I can't believe that we would just arbitrarily, um, you know, put money out there and, and not protect it in some way. Uh, I think it's something that could come back before us and with some answers on that. I I wouldn't want to rule it totally out at this point. However, at the same time, Commissioner Van Austin Ridge, I understand where you're coming from. It is taxpayer money. But we also have an obligation to our citizens to give them the best quality of life that we can. That is one of our jobs here. That's what we do. Does that mean to just take a chance on losing millions of dollars? No. But again, we need to look into it and see what is feasible. Is it feasible that we could do more than we're doing? Doc stamps. i got to tell you, some of us on this board, uh, Commissioner Whitmore and I probably recall a few years back, I think it was before Misty was on the board, 
Um, there was an organization that I am a member of that tried very hard to get the doc stamps changed. Um, Kevin's uh, profession has quite a lobbying group, and it was impossible to get it touched. Um, and I will tell you that the gentleman who was leading up uh, that organization at the time was in favor of changing a little bit on the doc stamps. That truly is an avenue that could be very helpful, but at the same time, I don't know that we could ever get it changed. Uh, no one else has been um, successful at doing that. Does that mean we need to stop trying? Uh, no. We need to continue to try to do that because that would be an avenue. Um, so it's interesting, you know, I will tell you, being the chair of this board is a job in itself because all of you have so many different opinions and I have found over the months that I can sit back, I don't hardly have to say anything because everything comes up through all of you. And so I catch myself really not having any questions and probably learning more than I ever would if I wasn't the chair. So I thank you for that uh, opportunity, but I do believe it is something that we should look into looking to minimize our risk as much as possible because it is money that came from the taxpayer. Um, I just wanted to add. For instance, the tourist tax. We had issues where we wanted to change that a few years ago. A, a county in the panhandle um, uh, got lifeguards paid for by the tourist tax because somebody uh, changed the law, any population under 300,000, they would pay. So anyway, we tried, uh, other counties tried, and Disney stopped us. Yeah. So needless to say, we didn't get very far. That's another example. Um, I don't re recall what, st if, and I'd like to know because I can't recall, and I usually can um, remember this kind of stuff, but Steve, um, what he did at the clerk of the court's office I'd like to know what he changed because I can't recall it. I know he he got very very um, frustrated at some things. It was, it was okay, is that what it was? I could not remember. Thank you. And, and just a, a comment and observation. You know, Commissioner Van Osbridge has an ide ideology that he's going to stand by. We all do, and we have to respect that. And just when we make comments, then all of a sudden we all want to go back at it. So to get you know. You know, we just need to, we're not going to change him. All you need is four votes. So, you know, Steve, uh, Kevin, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you, just like I remember, uh, I remember everybody said, you know, to set policy, you need four votes. So, and if the full board, if the majority feels, then it moves forward. But, you know, to hear, I don't agree with what Kevin says, but I'm, I'm not going to change his mind. I agree a lot with what you say, but sometimes I don't. I'm not going to change your mind, but we always can come in in a happy medium. You know, uh, that's why I wasn't going to come back at you because I don't agree, but um, that's fine. You know, you you come. Uh, that's how you totally feel. We've known that since day one, since the day he started. That's all. Okay, I'm, I'm going to butt in on that one. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore is correct in that it takes four votes. However, some of us do agree. Uh, you said it yourself. You don't always agree with everything that George oh, says. I I, well, I don't think any of us in this room right now ever agrees with everything that we all say. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we need to concentrate on having a, a coalition, if you will, of four votes. I mean, we've been accused of that we need uh, four, before. We need well, that's because that's what was here before the new board came in. That's exactly what took place. So, but the new board are not like that. They are their own people. They have their own opinions. They're accused of a lot of things that they don't do and haven't done. Um, but that's what I like about them is that they bring fresh blood. They, fr they bring new ideas. Um, and, and you know what? I like it when they say something that I don't necessarily like because you know what? It's a new way of thinking. So I think that's great for our board and our citizens. So um, I'm not saying, Kevin, that I totally agree with you. You know I agree with you a lot as far as, um, you know, the views of, of government. Uh, I do. Uh, and, you know, I mean, 
We know that George Cruz does as well, and, and James Hatcher, because we were all campaigning together. Um, but at the same time, we don't agree all on how we need to get there or not get there. So I think it's an interesting combination. And Commissioner Satcher, would you close us out on this section, please? <laughs> I don't know if this will close us out or not. I don't know <laughs> I either. Don't about, say much. <laughs> I might be about to kick a cornet's <laughs> nest. Um, uh, I... I would make three points uh, or three ideas. First of all, I would love to see Commissioner uh, Johnson's ideas brought before us and uh, so we could see where uh, we land on that and uh, if we have the votes to uh, increase uh, the, the return on our investments underneath the law. We understand that there's laws regarding uh, government investments, but there's no reason why we can't take his ideas and, uh, and work off of them. Um, I think that... I think that maybe some of our frustration, and I share this frustration, um, is that this entire workshop is supposed to be how we're going to run this program and what policy we want to set for this program. Instead, we spend all our time on an ideological conversation with Mr. Van Oshenbridge, Damn. where half of us agree with him, but that's not the topic of this session. So I would propose that we do have a session about tax cuts and where we can get the people uh, more of their money and keep less of it from coming into government hands, where we sit up here and have to take hours and, and days and weeks to figure out how to best use someone else's money that we should have just let them keep to begin with. So I agree with where he's coming from. What I don't agree with is us all spending our time, the entire uh, work session, to have that discussion when we should have taken this time to see and to give them direction about what the best way for them to do their overall program is. So I feel like this was a wasted opportunity, and we do need to remember what Commissioner Whitmore said, which is we just need four votes. We don't have to have Commissioner Van Austin Bridges vote to move forward and get something done. Thank you. Just real quick, because there we go. We got public. I, I, I disagree. That, that was policy. That was, I, I believe what Kevin was talking about, and the, the, the whole meat of this conversation was exactly what they want to hear. Because this whole thing was debating whether or not we want to use taxpayer funds or TIF funds for this program. He was giving his opinion on his view of the program. I think it was entirely real. I think virtually everything we said here was real. I thought this was a very good work session. They got a lot out for, for Jerry and Denise and all of us about where our views are. If you disagree with where we stand with taxes, and I don't disagree with your assessment, we got a budget coming up. We don't need a work session for it. Look at the budget when it gets presented to you. Come on this video and tell everyone which things you're cutting. We're good. <laughs> I'm going to close this out. Um, we're going to go to public comment in just a moment. Um, but I do want to say that Commissioner Johnson, no, he's not a commissioner anymore. Well, he'll always be a commissioner. Yeah. I actually had lunch with him the other day. And, um, um, you know, he still watches our meetings. Yeah. So he's probably watching right now. And, Steve, if you are, just be quiet. Because, uh, trust me, my phone's going to start blowing up any second. Um, but, you know, he does have a lot of good ideas on finance. Um, I know that there's a couple of commissioners, new ones in here, that had a lot of conversation with Commissioner Johnson when they were running. Um, and I will tell you that he got a little frustrated with our board because uh, some felt that he really didn't understand budgets. It's what the man did his whole life. It was his career. Uh, so it's real funny, but you know what? I am going to ask him to um, maybe talk to some of you commissioners, you know, with ideas and so forth that might be interested um, because he really did help quite a bit. Um, with that being said, I'm going to open public comment, and then we're going to take a 10-minute recess after public comment. Um, the first one, Alice Newland. Okay, well, there's a couple that's... Okay, well, then, Alice, you can wait. It's just there's some that aren't on both issues. So just giving them a chance. Um, Glenn Jubilina. All right, that's land trust. 
I heard that. Let me get this thing up here. For record, we'll Glenn Jablina. Shortly. For uh, Glenn, uh, for the record, Glenn Jablina. So let me let me put this in perspective and cut through some of the smoke and mirrors here. Uh, as far as the school teachers, we bet we got the best guy on the job, Scott Hopes. He can do both right now. Uh, you know, I'm self-serving. I wish you would stay on both boards forever, personally, because we can get stuff done. Go ahead, um, stop it. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let's talk about the down payments. First of all, you have to go through 11 lenders. So I'm not even sure that the, the veterans qualify through those 11 lenders. Maybe Jerry or, uh, can straighten that out. Um, the Polish fund, because I can't say Sadowski. The Polish fund <laughs> is, <laughs> is going to be good. short. Crumbs, you're exactly <laughs> right, crumbs. And Misty, we're not getting the money you think we're getting. We're getting $1.3 million forever. Those are the numbers, two-thirds. One year, they're going to give us 50%. So let's look at return on investment and to uh, Mr. Van Aschenberg's uh, investment here. Here's the problem I have. We're complaining about George on investment, right? Which, if we give a 1%, we're making more money than we would in the normal and Kevin's worried about, well, how are we going to get, how, what about the default? Kevin, let me tell you something. You got the utilities department. You can walk in there and get a 15-year loan, and you rape the citizens for 6% yep. for 15 years, and that's all done in-house to the most marginal folks we give loans to, houses that are falling apart that can't afford the six grand for water. So... They don't default. Right. There will never be any default. So I don't, I, I buy that zero, 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 zero on that, on that. Well, there was only like one or two, which is very low. So uh, again, you're charging 6% to the most marginal folks in our community. And you're laughing all the way to the bank. And they're paying through the nose. So George, you're right. Let's take $5 million and, and invest that. What's one of the best investments we have? is real estate. Well, let's invest it in folks that want to buy houses. Um, you know, we've made some bad deals, and I hate to be the guy that brings up the good, bad, and the ugly, but we took $6.2 million out of the health care trust fund and gave it to FPNL and Inesco on a five-year note that they defaulted, Kevin, and we never, we never penalized them or anything. You know what we did? We rolled over the note for another five years. So don't tell me about bad investments because the county has done them. All I'm saying, a much better investment is what George is saying, $5 million. Really, I don't think is either going is gonna, to is gonna move the needle much, uh, but that is the investment we should be doing. And second of all, we did a study for the school board. We found on a pocket community in the city of Bradenton, 12 homes. That's all this survey could find. 12 homes that were under 1,000 square feet and under $192,000. 12 homes. Thank you, George, Glenn. I'm with you. Thank you, Glenn. And by the way, he's right on the uh, utilities. Uh, I actually brought that up, and it was shot down. Um, moving on, Andrea Griffin, did you, have it, did you want to do now or later? Uh, procurement. Okay. All right. Seth, any phone calls? Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute recess, and we'll come back to the Community Land Trust. Thank you.
All right, is everyone ready? Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, Commissioner Satcher, can we get started, please? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> now, children, let's go. All right, so now it's going to be on policy consideration, community land trust. Yes, ma'am, Jerry, thank you. Yes, so uh, one of the challenges that we have been discussing for on the affordable housing front is the challenge of the cost of, of land and what role does it play in creating uh, more affordable housing units. So a policy consideration uh, to address this issue is a community land trust, um, otherwise known as what we call it a CLT. So that's what you'll hear us refer to it. So um, it is a mechanism that increases and preserves affordable housing unit. And it basically is another, just another tool in our toolbox um, to be able to increase those units, but also increase access and opportunity. So we brought this item forward um, to the board back in 2019. Um, we had a presentation from the Florida Housing Coalition. I know, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, but the Florida Housing Coalition did a report for us, and we presented that, and we had a discussion with the board on February 28th of 2019, um, where we introduced the board to the option of the CLT. Um, just in brief summary, some of the things that we had talked about, that the CLT, again, is just one tool as part of a bigger toolbox, um, that these are complicated, so they do take time uh, to ramp up and acquire land and lots. Um, it's not appropriate for all scenarios. Um, but it is a good tool to preserve units over the long term. And this is something that Commissioner Cruz has brought up when we look at all of our different tools. This is one that it really addresses this long term um, affordability. Um, but it does require continued um, political um, and funding commitment. So after this work session, um, staff was directed to move forward with researching um, the options. There were three options that were given as part of um, that report. Um, we have provided um, each of the board members um, that report um, as part of that, that binder with the PowerPoint um, uh, so that you were all um, had an opportunity to review prior to this. So overall, the, the three options were to, um, to start a, a new nonprofit. Um, the second option was to go with, a, with an existing um, CLT. And the third one was for us to do it um, in-house. Um, the first option of a new CLT was a lot more costly. So we were looking at basically option two, which is an existing CLT, and a third one, which is doing it in-house. Given everything that had been going on, in-house is not really an option. So we are down to... Uh, looking at an existing CLT, and there's a lot of benefits to that, which I will go into it. So our whole idea was to identify uh, a practical and an economical path forward to trying to see what we can do with this. So I'd like just to start with just kind of what is it? Um, what is a CLT? So going to the PowerPoint, um, a land trust really is just a vehicle of separating the land. Oh, hit the wrong button. Uh, separating the land from the building. So the land is held in a trust by the, the nonprofit. And then um, in this case, um, for home ownership, um, the homeowner uh, owns the improvements on, um, on that land. So the CLT is, uh, is a nonprofit um, organization. And um, they would hold title to the land, and then they lease that land um, subject to restrictions uh, to the homeowner. And this is how we would keep the homeowner improvements affordable um, in perpetuity, because you're removing um, that cost. So the purpose there, then, is that it does make that home ownership more affordable, because you're removing the cost of the land um, when you're buying that home. Um, and it's a way to keep that, um, that home affordable over time. So how does it work? The land trust acquires and retains ownership of the land for the benefit of the community. So there is the public benefit there. 
So then the, the CLT um, sells or rents uh, the improvements to income eligible households. And this is one way to try to target more of those lower income households. Uh, the home buyers purchase the house, so they purchase those improvements, and then they have the right to use the land by the virtue of the 99-year um, lease agreement to the CLT, and uh, it's a very low um, low rent that they would be charged. So that's how you get that affordability. Um, you would have those restrictions upon the sale, um, and then um, uh, and the CLT does help with that um, with that process. So the key benefits um, to the home buyer is that the price is uh, much more affordable. And uh, as you all spoke about with teachers, they're able to, uh, as that example, they're able to stay in their community and, and make that investment. And as was talked about before, there's also a tax benefit to that home ownership because you still are able to deduct that mortgage interest um, on your taxes. Uh, you can still share in that equity when you're um, when you're selling, but when that resale, um, that sale does go to another low income um, low income buyer, and it provides that additional financial stability without the fear of um, kind of rent increases or loss of housing. In the last segment, you talked a lot about rents, and while that's preferable for some, we've seen a lot of those rent increases kind of year over year, and then that's when some of the um, that housing instability happens at least when you have that home purchase, you know what your um, mortgage price is going to be. Minus, I mean, maybe in addition to increases in insurance, but it's much more affordable in those increases looking um, rather than, than rent. So from the public's perspective, because when we are talking about a, a nonprofit, there is a benefit overall to the public. Um, you are creating a permanent stock of, of homes. Um, so in the example, we were talking a lot about the um, kind of in the SHIP or our down payment assistance program. And in those cases, once that, um, if we do provide like that down payment assistance and they sell that home, um, if there was a lot of appreciation on the value of that home, that next buyer may not be able to afford that sales price or may not be able to lose it. So we lose that home as an affordable home. In this case, that stays as an affordable, um, as an affordable home. So then that nonprofit acts as that, that stewardship um, to make sure that the homeowner is successful. Um, it helps with the rental crisis because uh, perhaps more renters can then move into some of that CLT home ownership. And most importantly, that investment that you make into the CLT, that subsidy remains with in that property. Um, it's not that we're getting money back and then, you know, with um, increases over time, we lose it. It stays with um, that property. So, um, so in looking, as I said, in looking at our research of, of what it is that, that we wanted to um, kind of to present to you, kind of to think through it, as I mentioned, we looked at those three options and we felt that the best way to really test out this concept um, is uh, in Manatee County really would be through a pilot project. And, and to do a pilot project, there's two pieces of it. You need the land and you need um, the CLT um, and one that's uh, experienced that. So let's talk about the land first. Um, so we went through uh, lots of different ideas of what piece of property would work and we came across one that we feel would be a great one to start with. Um, for those of you that have been here for um, for a while, you remember the La Estancia property. That's kind of one that that's always uh, in the office kept referencing. So this is a, a 16 acre, I'm just going to forward here. It's a 16 acre tract. Um, this is right on Canal Road or right off of Canal Road and 28th Street Court East, um, just near um, Tillman um, Elementary School. So this was purchased back in July of 2005 by the Manatee County Housing Authority um, using our CDBG and our home funds. Uh, Allura was established also back in 2005 for the development of this project. 
um, uh, for 36 units, and 51% of those units um, would be below for 80% of those area median income and below. However, during this time, the Housing Authority was not able to develop um, to develop this property. So um, kind of over the years, lots of different ideas have been uh, talked about this, but nothing's really happened. So in our conversations with the Housing Authority, um, they wanted to kind of give us back the property so that we could then um, release all of the liens, but that would still be able to be developed for affordable housing. Um, so we thought this would be a great, um, uh, a great piece of property property um, to, to start out with. Um, I won't go into like all of the, the specifics, but just as an example, um, the zoning isn't quite correct. So this is one that if we do want to continue to move forward, one of the next steps would be taking a look at the zoning, doing a county initiated um, rezoning to be able to get um, what it is that would be feasible for some affordable, uh, for affordable housing. Um, so that's the first part of the equation is the, the land. Um, the second um, part is uh, the land trust. And um, uh, I have Mr. Frank Wells here, who's the president of Bright Community Trust, who is, um, uh, they have been um, in business for a while. They actually started out from Pinellas County and did a lot of work in Pinellas County and have now um, branched, um, kind of branched over uh, to Central Florida, and they have been very interested in trying to do some work with Manatee County. So we've been trying to work with them. Um, one of the discussions that we had as part of our last All Things Housing work sessions was kind of the partnerships and what partnerships are available and how can we team up real quickly to get some things done. So um, we wanted to have um, Mr. Wells here just to say a couple words and answer questions for you so you can get a little bit of a flavor of how something like that would work. Um, but overall, when when we're looking at an existing um, CLT, uh, we really wanted um, to look at someone that had the experience um, that will provide the best partnership and a best return on our investment as we go through um, working on a project together. Um, and we felt that Bright just, they have a proven track record. They have a lot of units. I believe you have the largest amount of units in the state of Florida in the land trust. They'd have the ability to scale up quickly. They have existing relationships and, and connections and access to resources um, that we would look at. Um, they know how to work with lenders and understand um, um, how to communicate with those lenders about how, um, how this works. And then they have staff that's already trained on all components um, of that process. Um, so they have like a mission and, and a whole philosophy, but um, um, as part of what it is that they do, um, they support the homeowners as part of the, the process um, because they'd have to income qualify those homeowners and kind of help them. They're experts at that housing, um, education, and of course compliance, making sure that they're meeting um, all of our rules that we would want to look at that as well as um, overall what would need to happen um, for the home. Um, so again, um, this is just an option to get started as part of here's a piece of property and here's a, an existing organization um, that would be able to bring some kind of economies um, of scale. Um, just pulled up a picture of a, a recent project that they did in Dunedin, um, which is a townhome project, which we felt that this would work um, kind of really well um, as part of this process. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Frank real quick just to say a couple quick words, and then I'm gonna, I'll wrap up with what we think some of those proposed um, options are, and then we can then open it up for, um, for discussion. Frank? Well, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, Jerry, I sure appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to be here. Uh, at Bright Community Trust, we see our mission as stewarding these relatively scarce public dollars that we have to deploy them in the way that is going to best serve the community over the longest term, right? We uh, are charged with these these public dollars and preserving them, putting them to work on behalf of the community and making sure that they're really doing their job for the longest term. Uh, I have appreciated a lot of the comments that you all were making as part of the, your discussion about down payment assistance because we want to make sure that those dollars go the farthest, that we get the biggest bang for the buck uh, because we recognize that housing affordability is a, a major uh, bottleneck to being able to grow businesses, right? When we can't attract and retain the workforce, really difficult to grow your business, really difficult to grow the economy. Uh, home ownership 
uh, is a great way to retain that workforce, to keep our teachers in town, to keep our police officers in town. Uh, and a community land trust provides a way to anchor those dollars to the land in the way that that affordability creates a permanent stepping stone for people who have only been able to be renters previously to have a step toward home ownership. Uh, we do a lot of work with our realtor community uh, to help people transition from rent, 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 land trust home. Our goal is to graduate them into fee simple home ownership. Uh, my board chair is the past president of the Pinellas Realtor Association. So uh, we work very closely with our realtor partners on promoting home ownership. We're also a HUD certified housing counseling agency. So we work very closely with our future homeowners to make sure that they really understand their household finances, how to get ready for home ownership. That means you got to clean up your personal balance sheet, right? You got to pay down some debt. You got to get that credit in shape to be able to qualify for a mortgage. And then we want to get you into a home when you're really ready for it. Uh, I'll, I'll point out that during the bottom of the recession in 2009, the default rate nationally on mortgages was over four and a half percent. Among community land trust homes, it was under 0.6%. Because we do such a great job of preparing homeowners to make sure they're really getting into a home they can afford, really getting into a mortgage that's a quality product that they can afford. So we're uh, very conscientious about the stewardship of the public dollars, both on the real estate development side of it and on the home buyer education piece of it. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Thanks. As I'll appropriate. I will finish up my um, my slide here, and then we'll um, we'll be able to open it up. So this is my last slide. So what are these? Um, what are some proposed steps that we would need to do? Again, these are all options, and all of this would need to come back to the board for the approval. We just wanted to get some general guidance on how you wanted to move forward um, with all of these um, concepts. Um, the first one really is to. Um, move forward to acquire the property working with uh, the Manatee County Housing Authority through an interlocal um, agreement. Um, we would kind of move forward with that just so that we can try to be looking at the property and see what we would need to do. We would satisfy that mortgage, that note, and that, that Lura. And then that would be available for affordable housing depending on what it is that the board wanted to do with it. Um, the second one, if you did want to um, kind of move forward, um, we would want to establish some just general procedures and implementation about the budget for the land trust of how we wanted to do that. Um, Bride is in a good position because not only are they a land trust, but they also act as developers. So this is one where we can um, kind of do both um, together. They don't have to do both, um, but it, that is an option um, to be able to, um, to speed that up. Um, we would recommend um, as an opportunity for affordable housing to do a county initiated rezone prior to conveyance. So this is trying to get the property as ready as it can so that it could be um, developed. Um, and then if you want to um, move forward um, with this, we would be looking at um, conveyance um, documents, um, partnership agreements. Um, we'd have to work very closely with our attorney's office on, on how that would all work, all those um, uh, negotiating on, on those kinds of things um, to be able to donate the land and then look at um, either the development agreements or how we want to move forward. So there's lots of different components, lots of different pieces, but there, there is a, a, an option here with a piece of property and um, an existing nonprofit to be able to try to test out the concept, see how it works. And, um, and it doesn't mean that this is the only option. There's other ways of doing it. Other, uh, um, if others are interested, like for example, there is another nonprofit, um, CLT, that's down in Sarasota. They have not been as successful. And part of that is um, kind of experience and um, the investment that the community has on that. So with that, um, that's the, um, our presentation. And we'll turn it over for comments and discussion. Commissioner Servia. Thank you very much, Jerry. Love this topic. So, so excited that Bright Communities is here. And since you are here, I have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, so, so do I understand that you, are, you will administer uh, the project, right, as a community land trust? It's basically a ground lease, right? Yep. And you're the developer and the builder. We are the developer. We Not the builder. Not the builder, right? We'll work with another general contractor. So we would need a builder. Okay. And then um, how are the common areas maintained? Is there like an HOA fee or how does that work with a community land trust? So the 
picture that Jerry put up earlier is a townhome development we did in Dunedin uh, a couple years back. Th that one has an HOA, so uh, everybody pays into it. That's a great example uh, of something that might work with this parcel because it's a mixed income development. It has a tranche of low income affordable units, a tranche of moderate income affordable, and a tranche of unrestricted units. We like that mixed income kind of neighborhood uh, and that makes the project economics better and also makes for a great strong neighborhood. Okay. So then only a percentage of the units would be restricted. Is, do I understand that correctly? The, that's entirely up to you all. It would be up that, to us. Just, that's how that one was done. Okay. Um, and you guys do have a really good reputation. I see that you've partnered with the city of St. Pete. We've done things with city of St. Pete, Dunedin, Clearwater, uh, Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, yeah. We've okay. collectively done about 500 multifamily rentals and about 120 single-family homes over the years. And on this 16-acre piece of property, I have a little bit of knowledge of this property because I worked on it back then, and I'm remembering, is there a wetland on the property? Do we know how many units we could get on the property? Do we know if we need a comp plan amendment? At a real quick look, there's about three acres and change uh, of wetlands. So we think it's close to 13 acres of uplands that are developable. Um, so it could be a pretty substantial townhome project. We haven't <coughs> gone too far down that road until we understood th that that's actually something you want us to proceed on, giving some more detailed thought to. Jerry, so, do you know? So right now um, it's zoned residential single family. So it's zoned RSF1. And the future land use is Res 3. Um, the property um, next door, though, um, is um, RSF. Um, so we could rezone to a maximum of RFF, RSF 6 with the bonus density for affordable housing. Or it could be the residential duplex um, dwelling units. Um, the property next door um, did have a PD on it for about 84 single family units. So, um, so we're just still looking through that, but at least that's the what the current zoning is. We haven't looked at the wetland specifically, but we do know that there is something there. It's a great location, and, and I love the concept, and I want to support it, but I want to understand how do we know about the infrastructure costs? You know, are, are, is, is this type of development going to trigger roadway improvements? Because I know there are a lot of needs in that area, and how much is that going to cost, and how will we fund it? So I'm going to have those kinds of questions, mm -hmm. and I know you don't have answers for them now, but Thank you for being here. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah. I don't think this is the one that's going to tip the roadway needs for canal. Uh, <laughs> I think we're, that ship has sailed a while ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I campaigned. Part of what I talked about during my campaign was community land trust. I love community land trust. I think they're just an amazing tool. I, I always try to explain to people sort of like a, you know, much, much nicer mobile home park uh, where people just, you know, well, because y you lease a pad for a hundred bucks a month, a couple hundred bucks a month, you own your own house. But by doing, I mean, the, the cost of the land under a normal house is anywhere from 20 to 30%, depending on the time of the market, you, you're avoiding selling that piece. It, it dramatically lowers the cost of a home to people that need it. So I, I absolutely love this. I'm 100% on board with, with using Frank and Bright on this. So uh, we met a couple of years ago at a, a housing coalition. And, you know, I, I was in low income housing tax credits back in the nineties. And one thing, one thing I realized doing the, the section 42 housing is you never want to be the, the owner and the manager of that. It's so that you can't screw up. There's a lot of management. There's a lot of regulation and oversight associated. It's not something this County wants to take on. That's not a viable option. We're much better off using experts that know what they're doing. Uh, to do this. So I, I'm 100% on board with that. The question is just, you know, obviously the, the details of how do you get sufficient land in today's market to, to make this, this large enough to, to really move the needle. I think this is a great starting spot because it, it does create a test case where you can probably put 80 plus townhomes on there. I mean, you know, from historical context that we're, we're pretty good at giving away density bonuses. I, we can probably get this up to about 200 uh, by the time we <laughs> we work it out. So I, I'm completely on board with this. I, I think we, we need to do this. I think we also need to look at maybe even our surplus land. I mean, contiguous land, uh, community land trusts don't need to be contiguous parcels. 
you know, I see no reason why we, we do have some of the surplus land and we always have to think about LORAs and, and agreements. Why aren't we just taking the surplus land? I know we're still going through that. And that's something we're going to discuss. But whatever we do think we can build on, I would say take that, that surplus land, dump it in this community land trust first, and then we deal with getting rid of it to the builders because it's already in our community land trust. It, it effectively creates the affordability without us having to jump through an extra hoop. People know what they're getting. We're giving them surplus land. They can't complain about it. So, you know, my big question would be, is there an opportunity after the fact? I mean, we have some developers that are doing this almost on their own without the benefit of a community land trust. And well, I'm not saying he'd want to do it. I have spoken to him about it in the past. But, you know, like Steve Reinhardt is looking at a couple of different parcels of land. He's a great builder. He's building things that are already affordable without even all of the, the extra hoops that, you know, I'm curious if there's ways of partnering up. I think that's a, a step we should look into as a way of expanding this initially is working with some of our, uh, you know, Pearl Homes and Reinhardt Homes and, you know, Habitat for Humanities to say, hey, why don't we all work together on this? We, we've got a, kind of a, a master nonprofit who's going to oversee all this, but why don't you take your land, put it in here, and, and we can all work together and, and make this bigger and better. I, I love it. You know, it's a little, I, I hate hearing things like we talked about this in February 2019, and now we're doing the same presentation with the same person um, about this again and saying it takes time to do and we've just had two years to do it. Um, we, we need to, to not wait two more years and, and have this presentation again. I don't want to come back to a work session on whether or not to do a community land trust. Uh, we just need to move forward with this. If I may just respond quickly, uh, we love to work with other developers. A lot of uh, things in our portfolio, we serve as the land trust and Sometimes it's a Habitat for Humanity when we're talking about serving that particular clientele that they're masterful at. Sometimes it's a for-profit market rate developer where we can get 20% of the apartments priced for that, that moderate income workforce uh, by taking the land cost out of the transaction. So wide open to whatever this looks like. We're trying to promote housing affordability to help more people not spend too much of their paycheck on that rent or mortgage, depending on what kind of product we're talking about. Mr. Bellamy? Yeah, I actually think this is a, a, a good move also. Um, for, for some reason, a, a while back, this land was thought to be developed for something totally different instead of affordable housing um, for the community um, out there. And, and I agree with what you're saying about the Canal Road. But as I look at this and I look to the, the property of the immediate east, I almost would like for us to see what we can do with that property too. But it's, it, we have a lot of issues with that property, and it's very dilapidated. And it's, it's an eyesore. It's creating a lot of problems here. I mean, problems on 29th Street, being a resident of 29th Street. Right? Yeah, point out. Yeah, that area right there is, is, is a real tough one. And I was almost hoping we can look at Look at that as well, but as as I think of this, I'm I'm a little bit more concerned, you know, about the number of units, and obviously I have a responsibility to make sure if this moves forward, and I'm for it, right? We inform the neighbors because some people have been very very comfortable in that immediate area, and now if you're looking at how many units you say you're going to be able to put there. Hundreds of units there, right? <laughs> if you if you're gonna put hundreds of units there, that's more cars and everything like that. And I agree to ship and sell by Canal Road, but um, and when I talked to Jan another day, everything's moving forward on Canal Road. I just would want to make sure that the the, the the surrounding community is is fully aware of what's coming, especially if you're going to get 80 to 100 units there, because that's cars and a little bit more traffic. And that area right there is not used. To that type of traffic, and they fought back, you know, very, very fought back a lot with the um, the Reinhardt project on, on 33rd Street, and um, he's getting ready to do another one, I think, coming up. I just spoke to him uh, about it, which is which is good. But I would just say, oh well, I didn't release the information or anything like that. But I, I just think we, if when when we decide to move forward, you know, we really gonna, will need to use Debbie Delion and her expertise to make sure that the community is fully um, aware of, of the positive benefits. You know, we always want to make sure we mention the negative aspects also, but the positive benefits to make sure we can have affordable housing in that area. Thank you. And, and we have a full-time staff member who's dedicated to community engagement work because we believe that's critically important that the residents and the neighbors, the whole community understands what it is we're trying to do. That That's a, a big part of the mission for us. Madam Chair. 
just a few dialogues. And this, this is not to say this is going to happen tomorrow, all right? And for the individuals that may be listening, this is something that's out there, and there's a lot of T's have to be crossed and a lot of I's have to be dotted to move forward. But I'm, I'm one that know that there's a need in this area, so I would ask that the community is involved when we start moving forward with it. Sorry. Attorney Clegg. Sorry. Madam Chair, I just wanted to make one other comment about land trust addressing uh, Commissioner Cruz's question. There's a legal reason why they started looking at them too, which is that when you're um, transferring owned houses, it's difficult to maintain an affordability restriction on them from owner to owner after a certain amount of time because there's these old rules in the law about those kinds of restrictions traveling with land. And so one of the reasons that they started looking at them about 15 years ago was that this is also a way that you can maintain that stock in affordability going from owner to owner with more reliability in addition to all of the economic reasons that have been cited. So there is an advantage in that respect as well. It's probably worth mentioning as well that w we require all of our homeowners to live in and homestead their properties. Uh, one thing we see with other kinds of affordable housing programs is people uh, purchase a home and then as soon as there's an opportunity, they see it turn into a rental property because there are more dollars than that. So uh, an additional community benefit in this investment. All right, Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, the, the other thing I want to make sure that we put out there, we've had some of the developments in District 2, um, different housing projects, things like that, and, and some are not well kept, right? And we want to, I, I would want to make sure as this moves forward, whatever steps need to be put in, in place to make sure that the surrounding area is well kept and it's not someone that ends up being a dumping bin like the property behind you. We need to make sure we put that information there also. All right, George. Commissioner Servia. Thank you. I'm glad you brought up the, the home ownership and homestead. So the state of Florida, as you know, allows Airbnbs to go just about anywhere. Does the community land trust allow an Airbnb? We do not. We require as a uh, stipulation of the ground lease that, that the owner has to be a full-time resident of the property. You can pass it on to your heirs, but you can't turn around and make it a short or long-term rental property. So you, there is a legal way to prevent the Airbnbs and a CLT. Yes, I, I looked into this because uh, another community elsewhere in the state that has a, a very attractive Airbnb population asked, and yeah, we've looked into this previously. Commissioner Cruz. No? Oh. All right, well, I don't have anyone else on the board. Um, one last look. Uh -huh. da -da. No, that's it. Thank you for being with us today. It's a pleasure. I'm happy to I, come back anytime. I think you can tell that we're all very much interested in moving forward with this. Right, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we do have like a lot of steps, as I, as I mentioned. And um, depending on where we go, we'll you know, be happy to invite Hannah Frank to come back as we go through some of the, the, the details. But um, I just want to kind of close it that we're, I'm seeing kind of head shakes of kind of continuing to move this process and going through. And just in response to Commissioner um, to Commissioner Cruz, um, we also wanted to bring this back much sooner, but um, we were ready last April um, to do this, but unfortunately we had COVID come and we, it was just, there was no meetings or anything and it was hard getting everything together. But I think we have a lot of momentum now and staff is very, very excited about bringing all this forward. So we will get to work. Thank you. Thank all you right. all so much. Let's go to questions. Uh, commissioner, Commissioner, um, citizen comments. Alice Newland. Good, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Alice Nolan, and I'm the president of the, the League of Women Voters of Manatee County. And I want to thank Ms. Lopez and Ms. Thomas and their team for their dedication and hard work to bring much-needed affordable housing to our county. I am here to give the League's endorsement of both of the All Things Housing projects today. Uh, we would 
Love to see an expansion of the down payment assistance program and the community land trust pilot. Um, and echoing the phrase we just heard, um, these are just two tools in the affordable housing toolbox. Uh, and uh, the combination of these right tools at the right place at the right time can bring our community forward and make affordable housing in Manatee possible. Um, the expansion of the down payment assistance program is not only a response to the changing homeowner statistics, but also aims to honor those essential personnel who provide services and helped us through COVID and will keep us well-educated, safe, and healthy uh, in the future. Um, the Community Land Trust, as she said, was put on pause because of COVID, and, uh, but the county staff has been working diligently to meet the need for affordable housing without the use of this critical tool. It's long overdue. Uh, the, League of, the League would like to see the Board of Commissioners move quickly and with focus to ensure the redevelopment and economic opportunity team is able to access all the tools that are required to meet the needs of the growing community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Diane Shoemaker. Good afternoon, Diana Shoemaker. I'm the CEO and President of Manatee County Habitat for Humanity. Um, and first of all, I want to say um, we are very lucky to have the team of Jerry and, and her team doing this kind of work. Um, as a partner in the community, I find it really refreshing that this team is coming up with really innovative ideas and new, new, new ways of addressing affordability in this community. And, and uh, we want to support that and continue to support this. So thank you for those ideas. Um, CLTs, I think, are a great idea. Um, habitats are involved in it. We would be very ex excited to partner around it. Um, the model that the CLT uses with homeownership and getting really solid homeowners in those properties, um, maintaining long longevity as homeowners, is a really, really valuable part of what CLTs do, and so we would support that as well. I like the idea that we have a spectrum, uh, again, the many tools in our toolbox of affordability. We've got rentals. We're, we're working really hard on rentals. We understand single-family homeownership, but this in-between spot for CLTs will address families that aren't able to, who may choose not to be renters and, and can't yet be homeowners. And we know the stability of home ownership and the difference it makes in our community. So I highly recommend that we consider this option. And the third piece about it is the sustainability affordability for the long term. We've got so much building going on and, and we need to keep building because we need homes for all of the families that are interested. But we're losing affordability of land and, and where we can maintain affordability. So this, this particular project and this particular opportunity sustains that long term and we can be a much stronger community as a result of maintaining affordability so that all of us have a decent place to live. So thank you. Thank you. Glenn Jubilina. Glenn Jubilina, for the record. Uh, Frank, thanks, thanks so much. I, I got a couple of questions. Maybe you can clarify. So the Community Land Trust, by the way, I did take that course with Jamie Ross here last year or so. I'm familiar a little bit about it. Um, can the land trust be used for rentals? Yes, right? Yes. Okay, my, my, my second question is now, you've worked with some other developers, uh, Jacob Sowers for one, right? So how's that relationship between a developer and your company? Uh, do you guys own the land and he develops it? Yes, yeah, so when I, is it okay for me to yes, respond? Please. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, so in a case like that, uh, we hold the land and the developer then pays a nominal ground lease and they're in charge of the development. And in most cases, then they wind up being the property manager long term. In the case you're talking about, it's a, a nonprofit in Pinellas County that um, kind of targets a specific population. And we've done a number of projects in partnership. Okay. So that's, that's, that's great news. So my, my other part is I think we're really missing is in uh, Y-I-G-B-Y, yes, in God's backyard. So there's an organization out there that churches want to develop their land. I think it's a real missing middle here. I really do. I think these churches uh, are, are losing 
membership and they have all this land. I think if we tweak the zoning and they partner up with a land trust as a nonprofit, working with one right now, hopefully it'll go through. I think there's some opportunity there to uh, do more affordable housing with the churches. They're in the, they're in the giving business anyways, so that, that's good to know. I guess my bottom line is, is you buy the land, right? Most often we receive the land from a city or a county or occasionally from another partner. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, uh, Chaff, uh, Jacob. So did they give you the land to manage it? or? In that case, the land came from Pinellas County. Okay, okay, got it. All right. So you would take over other nonprofits, and, and you really wouldn't pay anything for the land because you're working your deals, but you would set up everything and then get, get, get your residuals back. So that's how you make your money, right? We make most of our revenue from uh, serving as a developer on projects. We earn a small amount from the ground leases, but for instance, on a single family home, our typical ground lease is 20 or $25 a month, so that's a pretty minimal part of the budget. All right, and I like the part about the home ownership would be, be homesteaded, but how do, you, how do you filter the renters then? If they're not to go to an Airbnb. Uh, because they're... Usually, we, it's a stipulation in the ground lease. Depends on so if I'm working with a nonprofit that's going to build an apartment complex, the ground lease says you need to maintain. It's a hundred unit complex. Fifty of them go to people under eighty percent area median income, and another fifty units go to people under fifty percent area median income. If it's a home ownership transaction and somebody's purchasing the home, then the ground lease stipulates you have to homestead. You have to live in and homestead your property here maintain it to a certain standard and so forth. Okay, Glenn, I'm going to butt in at this point. Um, you're supposed to be making comments about the presentation, not questioning. Thanks, Frank. You know, I'll give you our our panel, my card before so. I leave. Happy to uh, take any questions you got. Yeah, well, no. Um, no, we didn't. I was giving him some lead way just because I like him. Is there anybody else that would like to come forward under citizen comments? And make comments. <laughs> Not seeing anyone. Seth, anyone on the phone? Oh, Glenn's here, that's why. Okay. Right. <laughs> I couldn't resist, sorry. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Frank, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm sure that we'll do some business in the future. Sure hope so. Yeah. All right, so next is Mr. County Administrator. Um, we'll go ahead and take a quick recess. Jerry, do you have anything else? Or No, thank you very done? much. We appreciate okay. it. Okay. And then we're going to get into the procurement process presentation. Yes, Madam Chair, and it will yeah, just be a... Yeah, let's take a, a five-minute break. Half just a hour. brief. Okay, I've got, got a half hour. I can go to my room.
16. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and finish up our afternoon session. Procurement. Jan, you want to fill us in? One of the things when the new board came on, they, they had a lot of questions about procurement and making sure, you know, how are we addressing things? How Talking to the mic. Very good. Um, so we had an opportunity. Um, I'm going to introduce Jake Erickson. He is your procurement official. Um, Jake has been doing an exceptional job. He was thrown into the deep end in the middle of COVID, and he has done exceptionally well going forward. And with that, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about the process and then work session on, on what we can do to bring back or what we can go, do to go forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jake. Excellent. Thank you, Jan. Uh, commissioners, Dr. County Administrator, Mr. County Attorney, Deputy County Administrator, thank you guys so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with you a little bit about the procurement process that we utilize here at Manatee County. So before I jump into it, I just want to throw a, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. I just want to throw out a quick definition of what procurement actually is. So procurement are the processes utilized by public entities for the procurement of construction, supplies, materials, and services at the most favorable overall total cost through the utilization of accepted practices that encourage competition, including best value and quality considerations, thus ensuring that the public good is best served. So to jump off into my presentation itself, um, the Manatee County Procurement Division we are currently, we are underneath the financial management department. So it is procurement as well as budget. Um, here is our mission and our vision statement. This is outlined on our website as well as in our manual. Our mission statement, our mission is to procure goods and services through transparent and efficient strategies that make Manatee County a premier place in which to live, work, and play. And our vision statement, to be a trusted partner who delivers efficient procurement processes, innovative approaches to strategic sourcing, and under, an outstanding customer service in order to generate exceptional value for Manatee County. So how is, uh, how is the procurement division currently structured? The procurement division is currently structured in what I, we have call, called them procurement teams. We have a construction team, which includes CCNA, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, services team, which is our non-CCNA, anything outside of CCNA. We have technology and goods that's combined into one team. And then we also have operations. So as, with, as part of the procurement division, we, uh, we administer the PCARD program. So we provide oversight of the actual PCARD program. I'm sure you all are very familiar with the PCARD training, which is thrilling stuff. So um, that's us. Yes, and, we'll, we, we, and we monitor it very well. Um, so overall, so what is, the, what is the function of the procurement division? So at the request of county departments, the procurement division facilitates the procurement process to ensure all applicable laws, rules, regulations, ordinances, resolutions, and procedures are being followed. We do not make business decisions. All of those, any time that, that we have to, to implement some type of procurement process, that comes from the department. It starts with the requisition, which is entered into our ERP system, of which we, they also supply all of the supporting documentation. We review it and we figure out what is the best way in collaboration with the department to put it through the applicable procure, uh, procurement vehicle so that we can purchase it within the confines of the law. Um, the procurement uh, division staff, they are responsible for ensuring full and open competition and equitable treatment for all potential suppliers in the procurement process. Staff is also responsible for the pre-solicitation planning, solicitation, award, administration, and documentation of all county procurement-related activities, contract purchase orders, and credit card transactions. That's the PCAR program. Um, the kind of what I just mentioned, again, the, procurement, the uh, procurement division does not tell departments what to buy. We just simply facilitate the process to make sure that it is purchased correctly. So some of the governing rules and regulations. So in the procurement world, there are, especially within public procurement, and again, so are the NIGP, the National Institute of Government Procurement, the intro to public procurement class is three days long. It's eight hours a day for three days. We, I'm not gonna keep you guys for that long. Um, so some of the governing rules and regulations that are absolutely applicable to what we do. Obviously the Florida statutes. So chapter 287.055 is the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act. I'm going to go into these a little bit further later on in the presentation. Chapter 255, which is public property and publicly owned buildings. This is specifically pertaining to construction and the construction of public buildings, infrastructure, 
uh, roadways, anything that is going to be a, um, anything involving construction falls underneath that. Chapter 286, Sunshine Law. Uh, we, again, we have to operate underneath the sunshine. All of our notices, or all of our evaluation committee meetings, they are publicly noticed. They are open to the public should they choose to attend. The only ones that are not uh, open to the public, but which we video or which we audio record, are the presentations or the technical demonstrations when we shortlist and select vendor, when the evaluation committee shortlists and select vendors to bring in to present. And then, uh, and then chapter 119, which is the public records log. And we, we work very closely with um, Mr. Clegg's office, county attorney's office, to make sure that we have all of the necessary contractual terms and conditions located within our contracts. We do a, about every 18 months, we do a refresher with the county attorney's office of which we submit our standardized templates. They review them, they update them with any applicable languages or any applicable terms and conditions as well as update the language to make sure that the county generated contracts are, um, underneath the specific guidelines that are outlined, whether it be statute or whether it be within our ordinance. Um, we also abide by, by certain criteria of the Florida Administrative Code. We do do advanced payment, uh, the advanced payment process. We assist AP in facilitating that process. We also have Chapter 2-26, which is the Manatee County Procurement Ordinance. This is, a, this is an important one. This is one that we have to abide by. This, is, this, is, this has been delivered and put together and we have to go by what is specifically in that ordinance and again that is that is also at, at the uh in collaboration with the county attorney's office to make sure that everything is lined up then we also have our, our procurement administrative standards and procedures manual uh, pretty much what that is is that that is the, the the policies and the procedures of which we facilitate that procurement process that is based on the four statutes as well as the procurement ordinance it goes into a little bit more detail and also breaks up the specific steps um, and then we also have our purchasing card, P-card manual. Um, again, that governs the actual P-card program itself. And then that is, uh, that's, because we are the administrator, there are certain rules and regulations that we have to abide by when it comes to P-cards. So purchasing categories. So resolution R-18-168 establishes the purchasing categories. This was revised in 2018. So just to give you a, a brief summary of the, of the categories themselves, again, so category one is anything under $5,000. Category two is 5,000.01 to 25,000. Three is 25.01, 25,000 .01 to 250,000. Category four, 250,000.01 to 500,000. And then anything above 500,000, which requires board approval, and that's that next point. Um, that goes into what is considered category five. So any purchases that exceed category four, which is the $500,000 must be brought back to the board of county commissioners for approval. Generally, we put them on the consent agenda. Sometimes we do have standalones that, that you guys uh, do actually review and take a, a good hard look at. So um, that, those, are, those are the purchasing categories that, that we operate under. The purchasing categories also indicate what type of solicitation vehicle we use. So anything under $250,000. $25,000 to $250,000, we do, we do something called, an, it's an informal competitive solicitation. So that is an invitation to quote or a request for offers. Anything above $250,000, we have to do a formal competitive solicitation, which requires sealed bids, sealed proposals. So then that way, again, if it's a, if it's a proposal situation, then we establish an evaluation committee, an IFB, an invitation for bid or an invitation for bid construction, that is strictly low cost. And I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit more as we kind of get further into it which we're getting into right now. Procurement methods, price-based solicitation methods. So again, this is where price is the determining factor. Price along with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. So in order to be considered responsive, you must have filled out and completed all the documentation that has been listed in the, advertise, the publicly advertised solicitation. In order to be responsible, you have to meet all of the minimum qualifications of which we establish in those in coordination with the department without you, we have established in that document that is at publicly advertised for review. So here's just a couple of them. Again, kind of, I've already briefly touched on them. You have an invitation to quote. This is an informal competitive solicitation process that is strictly based on price. Again, award goes to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Invitation for bid is the formal competitive solicitation process. That is what you guys are generally familiar with because most of the time this, the, the information that are the contracts that you guys are seeing are the results of an invitation for bid or an invitation for bid construction. And then we have an invitation for bid construction, which again, we specifically use for construction projects and that is uh, geared towards Florida statute section 250 or 225. Qualitative based solicitation methods. So these are where we, this is where we, we advertise a document 
advertise an RFP or an RFQ, and we receive proposals back from interested vendors. Once we receive those evaluate or once we receive those proposals back, we establish there is an evaluation committee that is established, and they go through and they rank the evaluate or they rank the proposals that were submitted in response to the document itself. Procurement facilitates those meetings, ensures that everything is publicly noticed, and makes sure that we have all of the scoring documented and or I'm sorry, all of the ranking documented in a scoring summary of which is available in order to determine who is the recommended awardee. So request for offers, that's the informal competitive solicitation process. Again, it is based on evaluation criteria. Same thing with the RFP and also the request for qualifications. It is based on evaluation criteria. So when we receive a requisition to do a, uh, to, for example, to do a request for proposal, we speak, we talk with the department, we work with them on say, okay, what are the main components that you guys would like to specifically see and like to and, and use in order to evaluate the proposals that are received? So generally, again, these, there, there can be many of them, but most of the time we generally stick with project approach, capacity, uh, proposer and offer, or proposer and team's experience. Um, and again, there's some, there's, some, there's some additional information that is required within an RFQ, which I'm going to get into once I start talking about 287.055, because that's pretty darn important, especially when it comes to the design piece of things. Uh, so, a request for, so a request for qualifications is the exact same thing. The only key difference between a request for proposal and a request for qualifications is that in a request for qualifications, we cannot ask for fees or price. It is prohibited by 287.055, and as a result, we, we negotiate the fees, and this is in later slides, we negotiate the fees with the selected proposer and the, in, order to generate that, in order to generate that fee schedule that is attached to that specific contract. The RFP, we can ask for prices. So we can ask, and that could be an evaluation criterion of which they can submit their prices and their fees so that we can look at it, or so that the evaluation committee can review it. Some other procurement methods, um, we have an inv invitation to negotiate cooperative purchases, emergency purchases, public-private partnerships. That is heavily governed by this floor statute, 255. I believe it's .065. Um, I'll have to double-check that and confirm. And then we also have a sole source and single source. So state statute procurement methods, this is, where, this is where we get into what specifically drives a lot of these big projects, specifically the ones that you guys see. Construction procurement. So pursuant to Florida statute section 255.20, contracts for the construction of buildings or infrastructure shall be competitively awarded to a licensed contractor authorized to conduct business in Florida when a project is estimated to cost more than $300,000 or $75,000 for electrical work. So if there's a construction project that comes in for over $300,000, we have to competitively uh, bid it and we have to solicit it out and, and we have to put it in the a, a newspaper of general circulation for a minimum of 30 days and we also have to have it advertised for a minimum of 30 days. Contracts may be awarded based upon the submission of sealed bids, proposals submitted in response to a request for qualifications or proposals submitted for competitive negotiation. So what that specifically speaks to is, again, we've got the IFBC, which, they, which is, again, price-driven, and it goes to the, mo to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. We, can, we, we have a couple different methods of procurement of which we can use. We can use construction management at risk, your traditional design bid build, which is generally going to be your IFBC, or we can go with the progressive design build, which we have done a, uh, multiple contracts utilizing those, forms of, uh, utilizing those forms of construction in the past. Um, Contracts for construction management, again, design build services, con uh, construction contracts based on unit prices and continuing contracts, which I'll, I'll also get into in a little while, uh, and any other contractual arrangements are expressly authorized. So CCNA, um, competitive, the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act, this is specifically applies to professional services, and the key here is, is generally speaking, is with design. So this is for any professional service, the acquisition of any professional service that is for architecture, engineering, landscape ar ar architecture, or surveying and mapping services. It has to be um, solicited in accordance with 287.055. Again, this is based strictly on qualifications. The fees are negotiated with the most highly qualified vendor as determined by the evaluation committee. And this is specifically used for design services. So how does the CCNA evaluation work? So for each proposed project, the evaluation committee shall evaluate current statements of qualifications and performance data on file with the county together with those submitted by other firms regarding the proposed project and shall conduct discussions with and may require public presentations by no fewer than three firms regarding their qualifications, approach to the project, and the ability to furnish the required services. And this is specifically from 287.055. This is what we call the fighting seven. So in determining whether a firm is qualified, 
the evaluation committee shall consider such factors as the ability of professional personnel, whether a firm is a certified minority business enterprise, past performance, willingness to meet time and budget requirements, location, recent current and projected workloads of the firms, and the volume of work previously awarded to each firm by the county with the object of, effect, or of affecting an equitable distribution of contracts among qualified firms, provided that that distribution does not violate the principle of selection and the most highly qualified firm. So once we go through the evaluation process and, and a, the evaluation committee determines who they'd like to move forward with in terms of a, of a contract, then we enter into the negotiation phase. The negotiation phase is generally led by procurement with, um, with a negotiation team and is a collaborative effort between the requesting department and any other subject matter experts that we think would, uh, be, ben it would be beneficial to bring them in on it. So the county shall negotiate a contract with the most qualified firm for professional services at compensation which the county determines is fair, competitive, and reasonable. Generally speaking with CCNA, it's going to be labor rates. It's going to be hourly rates based on principal, uh, project manager, and any other fee category that has been determined as necessary to, in order to complete the work itself. If the county is unable to negotiate a satisfactory contract with the firm considered, by the most qualified, considered to be the most qualified at a price the county determines to be fair, competitive, and reasonable, negotiations with that firm must be formally terminated. If we cannot reach agreement, we stop negotiations with that initial firm and we go to number two. If we, cannot, if we cannot come to an agreement with, with firm number two, then we move to number three. That's, that's the intention of why we have a ranking as to show one, two, three, so on and so forth. Continuing contracts. For specific projects that so long as the estimated construction project, uh, the, the projected estimated construction cost is less than $4 million, we are authorized by, the, by 287.055 to use a continuing services contract. So we would issue a solicitation and get a library of vendors of which the departments can utilize a work assignment in order to have them complete design services. If the estimated construction project is, or the cost is over $4 million, we have to put it back out, we have to put it out for solicitation. So that means going through the RFQ process to select a design firm, getting through all of the design, and then whether we do a construction management at risk or whether we do the traditional design bid build, that would have to be another solicitation that is tacked on at the end of the design period in order to get the qualified licensed general contractor in order to, pr to proceed with the work. Um, they also can do professional studies. Professional studies, so long as the value is under $500,000, we can also use a continuing services contract. Again, engineering, architecture, landscape architecture, as well as surveying and mapping. So in conclusion, at the department's request, the procurement division facilitates the appropriate procurement process based on the end goal of the department. If they want to, if the, if the Board of County Commissioners directs the departments that say they want to build a $10 million hockey rink out at Geraldson Farm, we can do that. We have to go through the proper steps. So that would include an RFQ to hire a design firm in order to design it, and whether or not they decide to go with a construction management at risk, they could do a design build, or they could do the traditional design bid build. Then they would get the plans, everything would be complete. They would submit us the plans and the specifications, and we would put out a formal competitive solicitation in order to enter into a contract with the, with the most, or with the, if it's a traditional design bid build, with the lowest resp responsive and responsible bidder. At that point, we would bring that contract back to the board for county, per, or for, for county commissioner approval where it would be put, presented to you all and you all would make the final determination as to whether or not you want to proceed with it. Uh, in the case of the competitive solicitations that require evaluation committees, the evaluation committee determines the initial and final ranking of the proposals with, of the proposers with procurement facilitating the meetings to ensure all meetings are appropriately noticed and the established policies and procedures are being followed. And then in closing, again, the procurement division, we work very closely with the county attorney's office. If there is a vendor-generated contract, we submit that to the county's attorney's office for them to do a full-blown legal review. If there is any exception to the established county attorney uh, templates that we, in which we use, we send it up to the county attorney's office for a full legal review. Again, our goal is it, it, it consistently comes back to risk and reversibility. How can we reduce the amount of risk? that the county could be experiencing from in terms of contracts and what, what can we do in order to minimize any type of, of potential lawsuits down the road if we have to. Um, and again, we work with them to make sure that all contracts are legally sufficient and that the procurement process explicitly complies with the established laws, rules, regulations, ordinances, policies, and procedures. So thank you guys very much. Any questions? Okay, I'm going first. Yes, ma'am. 
for change. You lost me <laughs> way back. Carol, I have the floor. Thank you. Way back. I'm, okay. I mean this nicely. Okay, but oh. you did. You lost me. So I'm just going to ask a few questions, and then I'll just make a statement. Of course. Okay. The Manatee Code, I was going to ask you about that. Um, who, who, the Manatee Code, you, you mentioned that you use that. Um, that's the procure. That's for certain things, or do you use it for everything? Or no, the the procurement ordinance is the guidelines by which we abide by. So that is established in our code of ordinances. That's again posted on Municode. So it's it's chapter two dash twenty six okay. of the ordinance. We probably all should get a copy of that because I, I I think it's on the website, isn't it? I'll I have believe. it as a copy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean I don't know that I've ever seen it. Uh, uh, you mentioned five hundred thousand dollars has to be approved. Um, does it? Can it be approved by the administrator, or who who can go up to five hundred thousand dollars? Up to five hundred. Yes, you, you have given the administrator purchasing yes. authority up to five hundred thousand dollars. Right, but he didn't say you had to approve it, so I wasn't sure if that was something that had to go to you at that point, or if procurement could approve it. I wasn't sure. So, based on how the ordinance is currently written. The county administrator has delegated that authority to the procurement official to sign off on contracts up to five hundred thousand dollars. Huh. Okay. That will be rescinded. Thank you. Who said that? Oh yeah. I think I'm not sure who said it. I'm sorry. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. No. no I, was just, I, I am discovering. Just so you know, I'm discovering right. a number of delegated authorities, and I've determined that the best way to do it is just rescind all of them and start all over again. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, I'm I'm just strictly asking. I don't know. I honestly, um, construction bids. You you really lost me because there were so many different there are uh, programs and this and that and this one had this and and it was it, it's a lot to take in in the one presentation. So I think that's, and I'll tell you what else I, I just wrote down, and then I just stopped because I couldn't keep up. Um, I saw something where it said construction, um, uh, you had to, to, to conduct your business in the state of Florida. Do we have anything for local uh, workers, you know, manatee companies or anything like that? When it comes to a definitive traditional design bid build, where it is low, where it is goes to the low price to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, currently no, there is a tie bid or there is a local preference when it comes to a tie bid, and that pretty much states that the local preference, if there are if if there are two vendors, one local, one non-local, who have tied for the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, the award shall go to the local vendor. Okay, but yet, okay, I appreciate you telling me that, and I mm -hmm. understand. Um, but I also know that on a lot of our construction jobs, we tend we have a list of vendors that we've approved, right? Is that correct? If it is under four four million dollars. Okay, and then it goes to well, our library wasn't under four million dollars, but anyway, I, I'm not. I'm just man, hmm? you know, making that comment. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is how do we? I know it just goes to an evaluation committee, and they're the people that choose who's going to build a building or something like that in Manatee County. Is that correct? An evaluation committee? Did I understand If you it is a construction management at risk or a design build, then we have to do an RFQ, which is the request for qualifications. That Those two solicitation methods require the evaluation committee. If it's a traditional bid or design bid build, that is, that's when we use an IFBC where there is no evaluation committee and it strictly goes by low price to the most responsive and responsible bidder. So am I to understand then that if we are, I'm using the library only because it's in my district and it's, it's work, it, you know, it's happening right oh, now. Oh, sure. Yes, ma'am. That's why I keep referring to mm -hmm. the library. Um, I thought you meant the library of contracts. I'm sorry. No, my mistake. Geez, Lord have mercy. <laughs> there, see what I mean? I can't keep up. up. The, the, the library in Lakewood <laughs> um, Green. Okay. And Jake is awesome too. Yes. I love him to death. Uh, so right. that being said, all right, like the library, for instance. Yes, ma'am. All right. So we know that I think that started at seven million. Uh, help me, Karen. I don't remember off the top of my head now. Mm. But anyway, I think it's up to close to fifteen now. So my point is, in that situation, how did we find the the person to the the company to construct? Who I love, by the way. I'm not finding fault with that at all. Mm. I'm just trying to. 
yeah, get so the that, process. So that was done with a request for qualifications because if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's a design build. So that was the. It is. So it was selected by the evaluation committee that we put that was recommended to us. Okay, but how did you get over? Well, it did come to us, so that's probably why I guess it came mm -hmm. to the board for approval. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm just trying to work all this out because you sure, got sure. so you lost me way back there because you had Sorry. so many procedures there. I, I couldn't keep up with all of them, and that's why I'm asking. So anyway, I'm I'm done. If I, okay. just I think make we're going to have to have another one of these. Well, no. If I, if I may just make a comment, this this was intended to be like a primer to just <laughs> kind of get everybody from. The, we'll, we'll send these out. Um, we'll, we'll send a slide package out, but this is intended to be a primer, introduce the complexity the nomenclature, the various rules and regulations and state procurement guidelines to be followed based on your questions and interest with a deeper dive after recess. Good. And, and the reason I'm asking in all fairness, Jake, you've got a very complicated department that you run. You know, procurement yes, is so important to all of us and, and you know, it's got so many factors in it sure. that it's, that's why I'm asking all these some questions that probably sound silly because you just know them just like that. Oh, they're all great questions. I mean, I think that's, if you're not living in public procurement, it, it is just straight up challenging. Yeah, It's it hard. Is. There's it a is. lot of rules. And I will tell you that I looked over at the some of the board members and I said, are y'all following this? And they all went, no. Yeah, I just <laughs> so want, and I, I just want to I know so good. that of all of the public entities that I've worked in or for or directed, this procurement department is the best we, that I have I have seen, so it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed. awesome. I mean, the, the department really is great. And, of course, it guys. comes under Jan, and that, you yes. know, there you go. Um, so I'm not finding fault with any means. It's just hard to understand sure. it all. And, and I've talked to you about that before. Commissioner yes, Servia. Yes, thank you very much, Jake, for an excellent presentation, very professional, um, and I really appreciate what you do. It's probably my favorite area of government finance, <laughs> what you guys do. <laughs> So I have a question about the piggyback ordinance yes, that we have. Yes. Because I, I don't know a lot about it, but if sure. you could tell me how often is it used, and my understanding is, for an example, a simple one, if we were going to buy copy paper for the county mm -hmm. and the school board needs copy paper, we can go together and say we need this much for both of us, and because of the economies of scale, we get a better price, right? Yes, ma'am. So do we use that do we use that ordinance often? So within that ordinance that is more of a cooperative purchase. So there's the, within our ordinance there's the cooperative purchase and then there's the piggyback. Piggybacking is where we piggyback on a contract that was competitively solicited by a public agency. Has to have those requirements otherwise we cannot use it. Generally speaking, you're going to get the best negotiated pricing because we have there's multiple consortiums of nationwide contracts. So U.S. Communities, Omnia Partners, Sourcewell, NASPO, those are all contract holders that have a, the GSA Schedule 70 and Schedule 84. Um, those, have, those are contracts that are put out for nationwide use with a bunch of very, with, uh, I, there's more than I could legitimately count and name with the amount of contracts that are out there. Cooperative purchasing, however, we have not, we have not utilized that very much, uh, at least since I've been here. I've been here since 2014. So it is absolutely something that we can, we can explore a little bit more. Um, it most certainly gives us the ability to go into a, to issue kind of a joint solicitation. We just haven't really found an opportunity to use it yet. Oftentimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, but oftentimes state, when we piggyback off state contracts, those usually have that bulk economy of scales within it, and that helps us tremendously. We, we can't, sometimes can't even get close. Yes. Yeah, very, very competitive pricing based on if we were to, it's like, the one example that I, that I use a lot is when we, we utilize, I believe it's an Omnia Partners contract for our Microsoft office. And the original quote that we came in, I think it was right around $1.6 million. And I think we're at $740,000 uh, for the course of the year. So significant savings can be realized through utilizing piggyback contracts. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'd like for Manatee County to share those opportunities that are happening because I hear that a lot uh, from people in the community. So if we could mm. share what we're already doing, you know, I think people would appreciate that. I have one more question for you, okay. and that is about um, local preference. If mm. you could talk about that just a little bit more, because I understand the procurement process 
is trying to get the best person with the lowest, that's going to cost the taxpayers the lowest amount of money for the service. Um, and But sometimes it's also very important to people that we choose local vendors. But there's a trade-off in doing that, that we might not always get the lowest price for the taxpayers, but we may be offering it to someone who's going to spend locally in our economy. So sure. can you talk about that a little bit and, and why it's important, the way that we do things? Sure. So, so the way that, like, as I mentioned, that local preference is currently established based on our ordinance. It's that if it is, it primarily comes into effect if it's a tie bid. It's not necessarily local preference, but consideration needs to be given to local firms based on the evaluation criteria if it is a solicitation under 287.055. So that, as I mentioned, that's one of the fighting seven that we that it, the evaluation committee needs to take into consideration as they're going through their rankings, where the office is specifically located. Um, there, there are pros and cons of local preferences. Um, so one of the big ones, again, one of the, kind of what you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Servia, was the, essentially what they call it the multiplier effect. So if we hire a local firm, they're going to spend dollars at local restaurants, they're going to keep the money in the community, um, and there's a whole bunch of other, you know, that kind of plays into it. And I think Commissioner Cruz, you might have mentioned something about that too when we, at our meeting. Um, that does come with trade-offs. Uh, there are, so that multiplier effect, again, it's, it's, it's very good in theory, um, but it also applies to when we hire companies from out of state. So for my, the example, that I'm sorry, out of, out of the local area, out of Manatee County. So if we bring in a company from Hillsborough, Pinellas, generally speaking, if, it's, if, they're gonna be, if there's a roofing component, they're not going to bring a roofer down from Pinellas County or from Hillsborough County. They're going to hire local vendors. We see a lot of subconsultants that are used on these major construction projects or major design projects that are in fact local firms. Um, so there is, you, you, you can run into a couple different issues. There's, there's just, there's the inevitable possibility of bid rigging where if a local preference is specifically put into play, you could have one vendor say, hey, you go get this one, I'm gonna get the next one. Eh, bid rigging can't do that, it's legal. Um, we also have, and in fact, I've got a couple notes. Reciprocity is a big one too. So it's, this was, I believe, and again, I wasn't here at the time. This is all just, this is what I've been hearing from my staff and from a couple other folks who were here. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, local preference came up a lot. And there was a lot of concern that if we throw up the borders around Manatee County, then they were worried that Sarasota was going to do the same. Pinellas was going to do the same. Hillsborough was going to do the same. So there is that issue of reciprocity. I, I don't have any real, I don't have any true insight as to what those other counties would do. I can tell you based on, I, I, based on that memo that I sent you guys. So Pinellas and Hillsborough, they straight up do not have a local preference at all. Um, Sarasota does have a local preference. We are included in that local preference. And then there's a couple other ones that also do as well. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear you talk about that because when I worked in the private sector for an engineering firm, we deliberately located our office on the south side of University Parkway so we could mm -hmm. meet the local preference for Sarasota. And Manatee didn't have it in Hillsborough and Pinal. Yeah. So, um, but our corporate headquarters were in Tampa. So when you think you're getting local preference, you may not always be. And it may not be as important because of what you said, where we're hiring local contractors anyway. We're not gonna hire we're not gonna haul roof tiles from Hillsborough County down mm. here. We're gonna hire someone. So sure. thank you for that clarification. And I do, I, I don't know if you guys would be interested. So I also I so I put together in, in regards of local preference, I, I went through the last three years. Um, of the contracts that were awarded over $250,000 by solicitation. And so I put together a Power BI report so that y'all can see I can get you guys copy of this, copies of this as well. If you give me a, just a second to get it to load. Just to kind of give you guys a picture as to who, what counties are we doing business with, right? And how much money are we actually spending with the companies or with the counties themselves? Yes, yeah, sorry guys, it's a big one. Okay. Majority Sarasota. Majority is Hillsborough. Hillsborough. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure, Sarasota. Ba based on the information, how do I? I would have been thing? okay with that. Let me see if I close yeah. this down a little bit. Okay. So based oh. based on again, this is this was information straight from our business proposals website. Um, that's where we post all of our solicitations. We also post all of our solicitations on Periscope S to G. I do want to talk about that too because I think that's pretty darn important. Um, so based on, again, this is, this is the master list from FY18 to FY21. 
So based on what we're seeing, we're seeing 110.96 million was was awarded or was awarded to Hillsboro. 103.77 was awarded to Manatee. 24.13 was awarded to Sarasota. So Hillsborough and Manatee, generally speaking, over the past three years have been the, the upper echelon of who we're awarding contracts to. So again, 2018, 2018, Manatee County was the number one uh, vendor in terms of spend. Also in 2018, we awarded 11 contracts to local Manatee County vendors and six to Hillsboro. And then as you can see, again, it just kind of, it just kind of teeters down as we keep moving forward. FY 2019, this is where Hillsboro took a jump. And I will point out that PCL construction specifically for the Lake Manatee water treatment plant filter upgrade, that $51.4 million project skyrocketed Hillsboro's okay. overall total. Otherwise Manatee County would have, we would have absolutely awarded more to them. Um, and then fiscal year 20, same thing. We got Hillsborough County and then Manatee County was at 22.15 again, but that uh, pool in Kent also out of Hillsborough County for the Southwest Water Reclamation Facility Headworks Rehab Program, that was 19.054. So that's again, a, a significant, very technically complex contract that we're awarding to somebody outside of Manatee County. So just, I just thought that was kind of, just kind of interesting. Um, here's again, here's 21. Again, we're only, we're not that far into it. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. I thought you guys might like to see that in terms of, you know, kind of get a better understanding as to where are the dollars actually going for Manatee County. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah. A couple of questions all related to local preference. Uh, we met back January, February. It was a long February. time ago. We met about local preference. It was something I mentioned a few times in commissioner comments and, um, something I, I had been focusing on. You guys put together a great memo, kind of summarize it. You all have a copy of it. it shows some of the other ones. A uh, few questions. One, um, do you know if other counties do something similar to that Power BI that's publicly accessible? Great question. I have no idea. I put that together after going in and pulling it well, all. Well, here's what I say. Okay. I'd, I'd love to get a copy of that and, and really sure. see it. Because what I'd be curious about is we're giving a ton of business deals. And I didn't care about the part on the far left. Because mm -hmm. to your point, a couple of projects massively sway the dollar amount. I sure. care more about that one in the middle. That was the number of contracts. I think that was a little more relevant to the discussion. Pull back up. Um, I'd be curious. We're giving so much. Oh, I don't need that. I don't need it back up. Are you sure? Okay, I'm sorry. Well, all I was just, we're giving so much business to Hillsboro and Sarasota. I'd be curious whether or not they're giving us business back, even if they don't have local procurement. Sure. I mean, are, are we just in a position where because of their size and scope, we're not, our, our businesses aren't even competitive. So are we concerned about locking ourselves out or, or some of our local businesses out of a county that they're not getting business in anyway? So I, I would be curious. I think that'd be a good data point of whether or not quote unquote putting up a wall is even meaningful mm -hmm. uh, versus situations where, for instance, you guys, put your building in Sarasota for the sole purpose. Are we going to get companies intentionally basing themselves, at least a regional office in Manatee, if we had a local procurement? I, like <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that's bringing people into Manatee just question, to get yes, into our, our system, similar to what they did with Sarasota. Um, Cause there are ways around it. You know, one thing at, at a minimum I would like to see just discussed because right now our local procurement, six counties, including ourselves. Yes, correct. I believe so. That's Hillsborough, correct. Hillsborough, Pinellas, DeSoto, Sarasota, and what's the little one? Charlotte, maybe? Hardy. Charlotte. Hardy. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, for, for our local procurement. So we do have one. Yes. But what I would like to see is maybe even swaying it, and this is my person, it doesn't have to be just a best bid. Some of the ones in your memo, which, which kind of really caught my eye, was someone could be, a local vendor could be up to, in some cases, 10% over. Mm -hmm. And they just had the right to match the non-local bid. Yes, they're coming a dollar so short. So it didn't have to just be we're trading stuff or anything potentially illicit in terms of that. It, you could have somebody from Miami come in for a million bucks. As long as Foley Bryant comes in at 1.1 million, we just turn to him and say, hey, you match this million bucks, it's yours. Mm -hmm. So th 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 there's a cushion there, which I think is is meaningful because people then, I, I don't always want people to drag down to the, the very last dollar. Sometimes you drag down to the very last dollar, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I know there we have places here, like, you know, Marble, for instance. I mean, Fall Bryant lost that to what, someone in Orange County? 
I mean, there. So I, I would like to see us look at this. I, I get what you're saying. There's this pros and cons to everything in life. Uh, I understand the concept of other people fighting us, putting up walls, but we already have a local procurement. It just happens to be six counties. I would argue only a couple of them are meaningful based on those those schedules. But I would like to at least see an analysis of giving our local businesses some level of preference because again we're talking about doing potentially 300 plus million dollars worth of cip work the number one thing we talked about is it interest rates it isn't can we bond it's do we have a bottleneck are we going to have the people here who can do the work for us and Mm -hmm. if we keep ignoring our local people then are they going to be there for us when we need them uh you know because i would rather them expand i already see folly bryant move into a much bigger building and hire a hundred more people because we're giving them so much business they don't have to do it themselves. They're actually headquartered in here. Yeah, but they're not winning deals here. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's just mine. I would like to see us look at maybe even a modification. I really did like the few counties that had that, some cases 5 some cases 10% overage where someone can just match lower bids. I thought that was a, a good concept. Yes, sir. Commissioner Satcher and then... Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I like the idea of maybe giving the last uh, chance to the local guy. Um, I had a couple of questions. First of all, on the evaluation committee, um, who's on that committee? How are they appointed? Do we vote for that? Is that all you guys? So, so that is so evaluation committee members come from the requesting department. They recommend who should be on the evaluation committee. Generally, it's going to be a cross-functional team of multiple different departments. You, we cannot have direct reports on that on the evaluation committee. That's strict. You cannot have, for example, I'm going to use, you know, if Jan and I were on an evaluation committee, I'm sorry, if Jan and I were, were recommended as an evaluation committee members, we both could not serve on that evaluation committee. So once it goes through that process, if there's anything that we see that maybe if there, if it is, you, Arbitrary. If, if it's heavily loaded in one department, it, uh, we recommend, hey, go find somebody else from another department that has some type of subject matter expertise in whatever this project is, and let's recommend that they become part of the evaluation committee. Okay. So, yeah, so when we're getting kind of a quick run through, I try to listen for things. Um, and in this case, you know, let's be honest, I watch uh, – <laughs> I watched, uh, there's this reformed mobster, Michael Francis. He's awesome. And, uh, and, uh, but he talks about how they used to, bid, you know, rig bidding in New York City and uh, the concrete club, they call it, you know. And um, so I was just listening. Where could you get it? You know, trying to think like Michael Francis 30 years ago. Um, we'll, we'll catch so, you, Commissioner. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a serious uh, that's a serious spot right there. That's a major um, uh, role and authority because uh, you have the pow- the power. That committee has the power to throw out a good bid and therefore steer that bid um, to someone. Uh, so I'm not saying anybody's doing that or that they're doing that at all. Uh, but I am saying, um, county administrator, that that would be a good spot for us to take a. You know, just a sharp look is the evaluation committee, and uh, if it's one committee that stays the same. Oh, and that yeah, is it one that stays the same? No, or it's sir. different every single project. It is different every single. That's project. great. That makes it a lot. We also put to... all of the evaluation committee members, if they are voting hey. members, through evaluation committee training and have them sign an agreement which outlines that they have received the training, they've been through, they understand the pros and cons, the lobbying limitation, all of the things that we talk about. Great. That's that's still in my mind a lot of power in one group, but. Uh, but that does make me feel better about it overall. So, um, and uh, let's see. And then the RFQ seems like that welcomes kind of some subjective criteria into the process. Uh, so I would just be, I would like a, a close look at to be taken at that. Um, do we have a tip, an anonymous tip line for if a, if an employee sees something that they think this doesn't, you know, that doesn't pass the smell test to them? So if they were to, feel like a bid went the wrong way on purpose, somebody steered it the wrong way. Do we have a tip line for that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Mm-mm. So I, I, I'd, I'd like us to look into doing something like that. You know, that's, that's one way um, that uh, we could be sure and all have more confidence in the process. We've got uh, citizens' funds, taxpayer dollars, and uh, we want to take good care of them. So if we had an anonymous tip line to say, 
uh, for someone to be able to call in and uh, and go from there. Um, and my last uh, thought is as we go forward, and of course we're always going to be improving um, and and getting a better process top to bottom where we all have uh, you know top level of confidence in the process. Uh, but even if everything is firing on all cylinders yes, and sir. seems like there's no issues, I think it would be, and, and you may already do this, but I'd like to see us do random audits of bid processes from beginning to end, especially especially the people that put in a bid that didn't, you know, that did their, their bid was thrown out early on. Mm -hmm. um, so to see, okay, what criteria was that person thrown out to make sure that, it wasn't uh, subjective. It wasn't, you know, because if you're making the rules, <laughs> you could change the rule. You know, when they when they wanted to protect the quarterbacks in football, they changed the rules to protect them, and it worked, you know. So if you're making the rules, if you're on that, uh, you know, in the process, you can change the rules. It seems like an opening to change rules to steer things in a particular uh, business's way. And we want to be a business-friendly uh, county, and we want everyone to make their money. We want them to make their profit, uh, but we don't want them to do it the wrong way. We want them to compete and win those bids. So there's two things. So I just want to I just want to clarify. So we, unfortunately, we we can't change the process. Once the evaluation process has started, it's all based on what was originally publicly advertised. So that's public knowledge. Anybody can take a look at that. Those evaluation criteria. Yes, when you get into it and they're reviewing the proposals as well as you know um, any of the past experience, whatever that the case may be, they each evaluation committee member comes up with their own ranking based on that evaluation uh, the evaluation criterion. And then that is put on a web, uh, put on a sheet at the publicly noticed meeting that the public can attend, of which we go through and it says, okay, if we've got firm A, B, and C, we're going to rank them. One evaluation committee member may rank them three, two, one. Another one could be one, three, two. Another one could be two, three, one. So, and then we take those averages out and then we average them out and we come up with a short list to determine who they want to move forward with in terms of a uh, an interview or an oral presentation. The other, just to kind of curtail off of what you're saying, we offer vendor debriefs to whoever would want them. So if there was somebody who was not selected, we actually strongly encourage it. We say, hey, you guys were not selected uh, based on what the evaluation committee has determined. However, we, all, we absolutely offer the opportunity for vendors to come in, speak with us, and kind of go through based on, based on the strengths and weaknesses that were put forth by the evaluation committee. Say, okay, it looks as though that you know, the, the option that you offer for project approach did not necessarily meet up with the determine or with the with the requirements of, of the evaluation committee and we can walk through and kind of help them we can kind of help guide them so that the next time that they, that a solicitation that they may be qualified for comes around then they have a better opportunity to, to boost up whatever their proposal may be just anecdotally have you seen uh, that process work so someone that lost a bid once maybe even twice but they come back and they get it right that third fourth time and oh yes sir yes that yes this happened multiple times since I've been here great they're very productive meetings. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Satcher covered a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, I really wanted to touch on the on the committees. I like his idea of a committee member being able to make some sort of an anonymous, um, you know, whistleblower type complaint or something along those lines. Um, I think it's something that you could bring back to us. Um, and I have heard. Uh, some some vendors, you know, come to me and complain about things that happen in those committee processes. Maybe it's sour grapes. I don't know, but they're fairly reputable folks in town. Mm. Um, so, is the committee that a final the final decision maker? Because I've heard that the committee has chosen one vendor and then ultimately it was overruled or somehow it was changed and maybe it was appealed. I don't. And then you know there was a complete reversal. Uh, and it went to someone else. So I'm just wondering who who is the final decision maker once once the committee reaches a decision, mm -hmm. how do decisions get changed? I guess is my question. So I think there might be a little bit of misinformation. Um, only Possible. because we so we have generally speaking with an evaluation committee and with the evaluation process, we establish, we set up our first meeting, which is the the initial technical evaluation committee meeting. At that point, all the evaluation committee members come prepared to the meeting with their score or with their ranks as well as their strengths and weaknesses as to why they ranked them the way in which they did. We put all that information up on the board. We, we go through all the rankings. We get it so that we essentially create a, uh, you know, if there, say if there's five vendors, it's one through five for the initial evaluation, the, the initial technical evaluation committee meeting. 
generally speaking, especially with an RFQ, it is required that we have to conduct discussions with three vendors, have to. No, there's no way around it. So we have to rank them in order to get that top three to move forward with. Now, the evaluation committee members could say, hey, I'd actually like to interview the top five if we receive 10 proposals. We can do that. So after the, we go through the after they go through the the interviews or the oral presentations, we see a lot of technical demonstrations when it comes to software, where they come up and show us a full demo. It's six seven hours a day of everything it can do. The evaluation committee comes back after that meeting or after those interviews to a final technical evaluation committee meeting of which we put everything they put everything out on the table and say, okay. We've seen all this information in the interviews. This is what they originally submitted in the proposal. And we say, okay, evaluation committee, would you like to change any of your rankings based on the information that you've seen from the interviews? So it happened, I, I think it was a, I can't remember the one off the top of my head. It was an RFQ of which a, an evaluation committee uh, initially ranked ABC, they were one, two, and three. They went into the interviews and during the interviews, vendor number three came back with a phenomenal project approach that the other ones did not take into consideration when they submitted their proposal. Because of that information that was gleaned in that, in that interview, the evaluation committee determined to take vendor number three and in turn rank them number one due to the cost savings as well as the overall innovative project approach that they presented in the, in, in the actual interviews themselves. So the interviews are there to clarify any of the evaluation criterion that are established in the document, as well as give, uh, give, the, give the subject matter experts and the evaluation committee members an opportunity to essentially interview them and say, okay, you mentioned this in your project approach. Can you explain that a little, to me a little bit further? Can you help break this down so that we can better understand it? And then that information helps drive that final technical evaluation committee of which they can change their ranking should they choose. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bellamy. Yep, I got a lot. Um, first, yes, I want a copy of the, of the presentation along with the definition of procurement. Because yes, you kind of read it and that was not a part of that initial um, approach. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I w I've heard some things about the, um, the committees and everything like that too, but you all know I don't normally get into that. Um, when the committees are formed, how, how confidential is that, those evaluation committees? So that's that's a concern. Right so <laughs> the evaluation committee members serve a very important purpose, and that is to evaluate the proposals. They cannot have outside people telling them that could potentially sway or move their vote. Well, what I'm what I'm saying is, how do we protect them from that? I, I understand and agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying if if four of us on that committee, I mean, is that up for for public records requests or is that up for discussion? you know, during the process, because if it is, you know, you can enter potential tampering, right? And those things happen off the record or on the record. Let's be honest. Those things happen. So my question is how confidential, you know, are those, is that committee once you've identified and you say this is going to be the evaluation committee for this particular project, you know, is, is that committee confidential to the people that have, you know, Right, it is. It's confidential until the first publicly noticed evaluation committee meeting. Right, and, and I'm, not necessarily, I'm not necessarily sure, you know, how valid some of the information um, that's out there. But I've, I'm hearing things like that also. Okay, can I get a blank copy of the proposal evaluation criteria? Just blank, right? Just sure. Some of the things that you all um, go through, and and, and, I, and I would like you all, and, and we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, be, before and I'm and I want to make sure when we start talking about local preference, there's there's some things out there about you know minority business enterprise and women business enterprise and definitely veterans veterans business in, in enterprise as far as individuals that are veterans obviously you know women owned businesses and minority owned businesses. I, I've asked you all earlier to kind of identify where we are with with um, with strides like that, but I. I also want to know, you, you gave us gave out five areas, right, within your presentation, which is why I want to look at the presentation. I want to know, you know, the dollar amount per area. I, I, want, I want to know the dollar. In, uh, in terms of the division structure? Right. Construction, IT, and right, other. Right, right, sure. because I think that, that'll help us get where we're trying to go mm -hmm. um, because my, my, my bottom line is within the procurement process, you know, how much business do we do? 
local preference, how much business do we do with minority businesses or women-owned businesses. And, and here's the reason why. If we're looking at the procurement process and we're talking about local preference and there's some opportunity for us to do some things different so those procurement dollars can stay in our community, I think we need to look at that. Yes, sir. And, and, and if, you, if we can start there and with, with those numbers, right, in those categories, and then we could break them down differently. And, and I know we're at the, the initial point of, it, point of it, but now is the time, right? My man told me um, yesterday, you strike while the iron's hot, right? And I took that. Oh, okay, let's strike then. And look at that and see how we can take local preference and, and have an have a, a emphasis on um, minority businesses and women-owned businesses and definitely veteran-owned um, businesses to see what we can do to move the needle here locally. So, um the pro, uh, proposed evaluation criteria blank. I would I would like to look at that. Just a learning, just a learning to. Um, the I'll give you one for an RFP and an RFQ because they are slightly different. Oh, for a number I'll of reasons, you. I probably need to learn it. Trust me. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, and I have one more. Well, I've talked about those five. One, two. I think I'm done. I if, I could, if I could quickly chime in too. So, just to, from a number standpoint. So, if if I remember, and again, I'm going off memory, so I'll I'll go back and verify this. But last year, fiscal year 20, we had 370 million dollars come through procurement, of which 8.9 million of that was with P cards. So there is, and again, if it, based on that Power BI that I pulled, I'll have to go back and again really dig down and get you the physical numbers for each of those each of those specific categories. But there's yeah, there's there's substantial money in between that. Yes, sir. We, we did nine million in P cards. Yes, sir. And, and nine million in purchases. Nine million in purchases. In purchases. Yeah, well, for, uh, uh, well uh, I, I don't even take mine in, in my wallet. I'm glad I don't. But it, it, I, I, I have Peacock. Singing music to my ears. I have Peacock background. <laughs> I was part when I when I interned at Tropicana. I'm mm. part of implementing Peacards in the finance department at, at Tropicana. So I'm familiar with that. That's a different number though. We did nine million last year. Eight point three million. I believe it was eight point nine. It was eight point seven or eight point nine million. Yes, sir. Okay. That's and those are all purchases that are $2,500 and below. Okay. Unless they have specific <laughs> authorization to spend over that $2,500 limit, they can't do it. Well, last year, remember, it was COVID. <laughs> last year was COVID as well. Right. And we were in an was, emergency yes. situation, and we upped the P cards a little bit. So I, last year's a little bit of a... I think it might be skewed a little bit. But that is the purpose, is we're trying to, to get them to use it. If, it wouldn't matter if we increased the. It, it wouldn't matter if we increased the limit to an emergency if that number was solely under twenty five hundred. You can increase it to a million dollars a purchase if we're only focusing on under twenty five hundred. Well, well with, with the state of emergency, so that we did elevate the cards to five thousand, and there were there's also emergency profiles that are set up. So when a state of emergency has been declared, a local state of emergency has been declared certain cardholders have different limits of which they can spend up to. So, for example, um, I think EOC limit one, which is the highest, they can spend up to $50,000 on a transaction. And then EOC, I believe it's limit two, is $19,999.99, um, all of which has to go through our Bank of America Works program to ensure that everything is checked out and it meets all the requirements from AP. And I would imagine two million of it was hand sanitizer. I'm just saying, but, you know, by but, the time. But remember, was still under twenty. The, the purchase under twenty five hundred. We weren't buying. We, that, we were, oh, with with COVID, we spend a lot. We spend higher than twenty five hundred on the actual with the actual P cards. It's uh, an emergency. So, okay, so then I misunderstood. You had said the eight point seven or whatever it was was strictly purchases under twenty five hundred. So that part of it is what I misunderstood. That's all purchases. That is all purchases with P cards last year. Yes. Sir. Regardless of size. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. That was just from our year end report. Gotcha. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just want to go to a, a couple of things because uh, Commissioner Bellini and I've had a number of conversations uh, around procurement and um, engaging local vendors and women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. And um, uh, when Byron Shin and I were on the USF Board of Trustees, we had a, a whole series of, of pretty much all-day events where, where interested parties could come in and, and learn 
you know, how to do business with, with the county uh, and, and, and working through the process. Uh, the, the school board just went through a pretty lengthy process of totally restructuring uh, our procurement guidelines for construction management and architects and engineers to have both a local preference in, in the weighting mechanism as well as women and minority owned preferences uh, the local preferences, it depends on the money, whose money you're spending, uh, but, but those, are, but those are, are things that we've been looking um, at in the past uh, few weeks uh, to be able to move that forward. With regards to the, 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 the committees that are set up, most of this is in the sunshine, and it has to be in the sunshine. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have read that the school district got into a little bit of a, a trouble when they awarded two contracts almost concurrently and there was no documentation of how they went from 14 proposers down to a short list of four. Uh, and so, uh, but, but at any rate, with regards, and I know Mr. Bellany went out, I mean, th there's no secrets in this and there's not supposed to be under, under state law. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted this, this sort of primer uh, is so that you, you, you get an overview of how it's conducted uh, and it's it's very much out in the open. It's public record how these things are scored, how you went from a, a, a long list to a short list and a final list. And then, as you know, many, many of these come to the board uh, for your approval, uh, most on the consent agenda, but but they do come to board approval if they're over $500,000. If I could just jump into Dr. Hope's great point. Um, so at the end of every solicitation, prior to it going to the board, we post a notice of intent to award. That essentially kicks off what we call the protest period. It opens up the ability, if somebody believes that there's, there was an issue with the procurement process and they had submitted a bid or a proposal, they can follow our protest policy or our protest procedure in order to, to submit a protest and then we review it again. That's where something that we would work very heavily with, with uh, the county attorney's office uh, to make sure that that process is followed. But again, that is all, that's all, just like Dr. Hope said, that is all public facing documentation that's on our website. We put it on Periscope s g so that everybody knows how the decision made was made. And now, one thing that may not have come up in the conversation, this may be for, for both you, Mr. Clegg, and you, is with certain procurements, are there periods of a cone of silence when I or board members should not be engaging in conversations with bidders uh, about a bid or a proposal. Oh, Dr. Hopes, I'm so glad you brought that up as well. Thank you. Um, absolutely. As soon as that solicitation is advertised, the cone of silence goes up. And what I, what I, I commissioners, I'm going to ask you guys, and I, I'm, I'm begging y'all, if y'all get calls or emails specifically about something that has been advertised, we send out those lobbying limitation emails so that you guys are aware of everything that we posted. If you get any calls from vendors, please forward them to me. Send them to me. Allow me to, to, to figure out what they're specifically asking about because at the end of the day, you guys are the ultimate decision makers on a contract that needs to come back for approval. And if we have, just like what Dr. Hope was saying, we, we want to shut down even the appearance of impropriety not necessarily in propriety itself, but even the appearance, anything that could be misconstrued as, oh, so-and-so had an undue influence on one of the voting members, we, that, we can't have that. And if they're, what we take very seriously is that if, that if if we get wind of that situation, we investigate it thoroughly, and if it comes down to it, we will either remove that evaluation committee member from that evaluation committee, or we will shut down the entire solicitation and resolicit it at a later time. We do not mess around with any of that, with the, especially with the cone of silence. That's, that's public law. Mm -hmm. I think you should probably know that the commissioners, to my knowledge, have never, I've never had a phone call from anyone regarding something that they were going to bid on. Good. I have had phone calls from people after the fact. And, and that's why I think mm -hmm. for many of us, we're looking at this so intently. Because I think there has been a lot that maybe the commissioners, we don't know or understand. Sure. Uh, and I've got a list of things here, but everybody keeps adding to it, and I try to leave myself to last. So <laughs> let's get on with this. Commissioner yes. Servia, you're next on the board. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate this presentation so much, because, and I have a lot of respect for the procurement law, because it is designed to create the most fair and equitable situation that results in the best purchase for the people. I mean, there is... Same. 
That, that is the way it is. And that cone of silence that you talk about, um, if there's a question as somebody who's bid on the other side bidding, um, you know, then what you have to do is you go to the official, you ask the question or through the, the portal, and that question and answer goes out to everybody. So right. everybody gets the same information at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Um, and that's just another little way we make it fair. Um, and so I just have a couple of comments on, um, on some of the conversation. I, I think it's easy to think about the vendor in these situations and to think about, um, you know, being fair to our local businesses and, and hiring our local businesses. But I'm, I'm going to ask everybody to think about fairness to the taxpayer, um, and and not, let's put the vendor as number two, because when, when as somebody who's written these proposals before for or RFP, RFQ, um, what happens is there's a public sector job and the firm looks at it and goes, okay, these six people, take a look at it. Is it a go or a no-go? And everybody's got to consider how much time it's going to take, how, how, what their billable rate is, you know, uh, and do a little spreadsheet that comes out to a dollar amount, which is usually about $100,000, to go after a public sector job. Is it worth it? Do we have a good enough chance of getting it? Should we go? Is it a go or a no-go? And so then what happens when we start putting layers of regulations on local preference or, you know, if you match it, let's talk about the match, which sounds like such a great idea, right? Let's let our local guys match somebody from Tampa, and then that way we'll get the local guys in the door. Okay, but I think the other side of that is the guy from Tampa is going to go, eh, I get, I'm a no-go on this one because you know how Manatee County is. They're going to give it to the local guy every time. I'm not even going after it. And then the local guys are going to go, hey, they're going to go after the local guy. We got a little more buffer area. So it does, every layer of regulation you put on it, it compromises the integrity of the proposal. I just want everybody to think about that. Um, it, it's really important because uh, every little thing matters. And after you work, day and night, blood, sweat, and tears putting together that, that RFP packet and you put it in those sealed envelopes, which I've done, and you run it to the mm -hmm. person in charge because it has to be there by 4.30 and you go, it's here, time stamp it, please. Because right. if it's one minute late, we're not accepting it. No, one minute late, they no, don't man. accept it. And, and <clears throat> then, you know, you might be shortlisted or you might not. And when you're not, it hurts because sure. you just socked a lot of money away in going after that work. So I just want everybody to kind of understand, think more about the taxpayers than the vendors, um, and that way we'll get the best value, I think. I think, Commissioner Sir, if I could also... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. I, I was just going to. I was just going to quickly comment on on what you're saying. Is is one of the other because uh, I've read a couple of white papers on local preference, particularly from a couple of government institutions, and one of the things that that I th that is a is a worthwhile consideration is the capacity. Do, if we, you know, I, I've read a couple of papers where I think it was Broward County in 2018 they actually rescinded their local preference because what they noticed is that number one their bids are just straight up coming in higher, but two, they were seeing a lot of they started noticing a lot of change orders. And they start, so they started talking to the vendor community, and they're saying, why are we adding calendar days? Like, what, what seems to be the issue? And it turns out they were just taking on too much work. Because of the local preference that was in place, it had, a, it had sort of a, a negative impact on the amount of work that the actual local vendors could handle. I agree with what Commissioner Cruz is saying. If Folly Bryant can hire another 100 people to be able to provide, you know, what, provide the architect or design services, that's another story. However, again, that's just something to put out into the ether as that is a consideration that, that sh I think should be taken into consideration. Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, the county administrator kind of hit where I was going, uh, but I will just reiterate it. I like the idea of uh, doing the, you know, you mentioned the debriefings when someone misses a bid. Yes. Um, I love the idea of doing briefings, you know, or, or events where we go through some of these, um, you know, some of these agencies and companies that want to get more county business 
And really, even if that costs us time, some time and some money to put on something, hey, this is for minority businesses or this is for you know everyone downtown, even if that costs us a little bit of time and money up front, it's worth it to us long term because then we have more competition. We have yes. more people that are in and a part of the process. Uh, so I would like to encourage that. I'm excited about seeing that coming down the line. Thank you. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really, jump quick. I really just liked Dr. Hope's sort of idea. I'm sure it's not his idea, but what he mentioned, uh, the idea of sort of having an expo of some kind um, and, and an educational expo of some kind for vendors, right, to bring Yay. in new vendors. I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I thought it was a super idea. Um, so for the so the obviously COVID threw us the fur loop. Um, so sure. again, I couldn't I couldn't justify bringing 100 plus vendors into the convention center over the past. I think I think we started in either 2015 or 16. We have a vendor outreach outreach uh, convention. So what we do is we rent a, we rent a room over at the convention and visitors bureau, sure. and we have different departments from the county come in. They line up along the wall. We have laptops set up so that vendors can come in and register on our vendor registry. And then we also put on uh, a couple classes as to like how do you want to do business with the county. I just did a I did a webinar with Manti County Chamber of Commerce in January. Um, that kind of that that it kind of is going to help us jumpstart to get back into. I'm shooting for. I th I'm shooting for the qu for quarter one of 2022 of when we're going to get our supplier outreach uh, consortium is I think what we call it our, our community outreach uh, event put back over at the CVB so that will yeah. most certainly become and, and that was my, you took the words out of my mouth I was going to say you know include the chamber and ask them to include the Florida chamber as well I don't know yes. if it would just be us we try to um, hit all the local chambers we have Minnesota Black Chamber we have Latin Gulf Coast Builders Exchange Manatee County all of those folks also receive our solicitations you have the BIA. Yeah. I think I just wondered so. Wondering how you'd have the Gulf Coast Builders Exchange and not the Building Industry of America, so that's why. I'd have to double check that. I don't think that we. we I think we primarily we primarily focus we, we on the chambers. Yeah. Uh, I'll look into a commissioner. For yeah, sure. I'm just curious. Yeah. If, you know, if you're going to have one of those, you need to make sure you have the other. Yes. Can't imagine how that would ha not you guys. Know. Can Can I offer one thing? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the project you're going to take, take away with money, this year worry. of helping, vamping up how? individuals are going to sign up or if they don't know how to sign up you want to talk about that for just a few seconds sure so so there so there are a couple a couple pretty exciting <laughs> we're talking about procurements so there's a couple pretty exciting procurement things we got going on recently um <laughs> number one we are we have we are actively working on turning on electronic bidding within our periscope s to g huge because what that means is that now vendors do not have to print out the copies of the solicitation Easy. fill everything out to it it is so very, easy. very slick. We are currently working with Periscope S to G. Um, Periscope Holdings is the company itself, where, again, where we do all our advertisements, to turn on electronic bidding. We're going to titrate it in with some lower dollar uh, solicitations, and then eventually, if we find it successful and we have very explicit instructions that we've, that we've created, then we'll start to open it up for more of the higher dollar thing. But in terms of, in terms of actual vendor engagement, we're going to walk through and we're going to create a video. Um, that pretty much for about my goal is is five ten minute clips or even a fifteen minute video with you know two minute three minute four minutes. So if somebody says, "I oh, mean, I don't I don't necessarily know where to find the minimum qualifications," they can just click on that link or or they they scroll forward to that point in the video and it gives them the absolute breakdown of everything that they need to know. So we're going to do a start to start to finish with electronic bidding and hopefully that's going to start to streamline a whole lot of the paper stuff that we've been doing. Awesome, I like that and I, I love the expo. I Keep, keep, I think you should keep all of us in the loop. I, th I think you should invite all of us to that as well. 100%. Okay, awesome. I would love it if you all show up. I'll tell you, I like this guy. He's very smart oh, and Jake really passionate awesome. about procurement, but, but he's right passionate about it. It's so. thrilling stuff. You know, it's yeah, really thrilling. The world of procurement is just really a there lot of ups and downs. All right, it's thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I got a four and a two year old, so <laughs> they're running me ragged. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I just got a couple. You know, I. Uh, it, Commissioner Satcher, you brought up about audits. You can get an audit done. All you, there's a couple of ways. I don't know if anyone has gone over this with you. Probably not. Um, uh, Byron Shin, his office. Uh, I think the guy that does ours is Tim Gruders. It's Joe Gruders' brother that works and does the audits for the county. You can also uh, talk to um, uh, the clerk's office. They can do them for you. I've had them mm -hmm. call me and say, you know, have you heard of anything? Is there anything, any audits we need to be looking at? And, you know, so you do have a couple of avenues open to you if you're looking. And the county administrator, I'm sure, can help you with that as well. Um, the, 
The other thing that I would say, and, and you know, procurement, I'm glad we're getting into this because mm. we've got a great department. But I also know from being here for so long, sometimes too long, that there are ways that things can happen, not necessarily by anyone in procurement, but, you know, I can, I'll do a little, don't you worry about it, little buddy, I can take care of it. It happens. So mm. that's why I think you're, you're hearing some of the questions that, you know, you're hearing from us. Misty's looking like, what, who? You'd think about it, you'd know. Um, so, you know, it's just stuff that, that we need to make sure that we finally make sure we get it right. Certainly. Like, like you mentioned, um, you know, that, that your department has the authority to, to bid out a half a million dollars. Um, I didn't know that. You know, I thought it had to be the county administrator, but that's why I ask. You know? there ha well, there's, there's certain procurement processes that do ha that we have to go by. We have to either do three quotes, we have to do an ITQ, there has to be something oh, that we have to put out. It should never be, I don't think, for a, a, an amount such as that, that it should be left up to procurement. I mean, it's too, you know, that needs to be on a higher level, I think. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with you guys totally at understand. all, Jay. Sure. Um, the other thing that, that I, and I didn't quite catch it all, but you said something about, uh, uh, was it the EOC that's $50,000 per so transaction? Is that what I heard? Only, yes, only during a state of emergency. So, okay. for example, if a hurricane uh. comes through and blows this place out, those EOC limits, once we flip that EOV, once you guys activate your state of emergency, we activate the P cards so that they can only be used during that state of emergency. So is it the EOC that can do $50,000 tra a transact? Is that, did I there, hear that there, right? There are certain cardholders that have that authority that... That, but again, that I don't only, even have that authority. What is my limit? Where, where yeah, I, I, I mean, think you were twenty five hundred per oh person single little, transaction, you know, ten thousand a month. I changed my ours? entire opinion on this person. What is it? <laughs> I think it's I think it's twenty five hundred per transaction, and then really? ten thousand a month. You know what? Yes. You, you it's just obvious me they right didn't. Up. Thank it, you. It, it's obvious um, all of you didn't go through your P card training like I had to before I could even pick up. Well, my I P think card. we need to look at that P card training myself, uh, Mr. County Administrator. I'm going to ask for uh, an audit of all departments. In, in our county, I think I, we should know what their spending limit is at this point. We are under a I, state of emergency right now so that I we can, have requested to be canceled, and we, we were told we couldn't, so we're still in it. So what is the authorization for every department in this county? Absolutely. We can most certainly Somebody pull that report. Everything's done in Bank of America Works, so we can, I can absolutely <laughs> pull that report and give it to you. It very explicitly Blake breaks down who has that spending authority yeah. in September of 2020, we sent out a memo as an internal memo to the departments that said, you are no longer allowed to use your P cards for purchases over 2,500 unless you have specific written approval from myself and from Gwendy Dixon, our P card administrator. So they cannot use that card. The administration, the, the, the administrator or deputy county administrator didn't have that uh, ability to approve that? No, they, they most the certainly can. Yeah. Oh, for, I'm sorry, for well, you were saying, that's why I asked. You were Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, if you could and get sure. us a and list are, of those, I'd really yeah, appreciate and it. I, and I will tell you, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I mean, there are very, very tight controls on P cards. I mean, the, the state, you know, went through this a, a, a number of years ago, and it's, 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 it's probably one of the most tightly controlled purchasing mechanisms that you have in, in government. And, uh, and, but I, I believe in audits, and I believe in the internal audit function, and um, you know, even worked on the state legislation to ensure that every single department in a political subdivision, county government, school board, has to undergo an audit every five-year cycle, every aspect of the organization. We're in the middle of one right now with the Office of the Inspector General across the street. They're currently oh, auditing our PCAR program he, as we really speak. They're really getting busy over there, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, I just think it would be good information. I think, you know, the Board of County Commissioners, we're at the top, so we need to know this information. Certainly. Um, you know, because you floored me when it, it was everything I could do to go, when you said it, $50,000 for, you know, I was like, well, well who, who, who in this county can do that? I don't even think the only county people. attorney can do that. Can you do that? I don't remember what ours is. I think it might be. I don't remember what it is, to be honest with you. 
I haven't picked up my key card. I'm not sure I want one. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Bill, we'll put you through training. I've never seen mine. I handed the envelope to Vito yeah. the day before. Yeah. I have to be honest with you all about that. I mean, that that those can become a subject of real consternation within an organization if they're not used carefully. Well, uh, there was a terrible situation down in Sarasota some years ago. Oh, I remember that. The, the administrator, administrator cost him. Yeah. Is that the one where? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So we do need to be really careful with those in terms. And of I'm who, not saying anything's wrong, Bill. I don't who mean it that way. Who gets to but... use them and for how much? So. That is, that is one aspect of procurement, which I will just straight up be honest, it just is frightening. Yeah. P cards are scary. I mean, just November of 2019, Hillsborough Area Regional Transit, CEO got popped for P card violations. The board, voted to, the board voted to fire him. He ended up, they gave him the opportunity to resign. I mean, there's just a laundry list. There was another one that I just read recently about, uh, it, was a, it was an IT director at a sheriff's office who was doctoring invoices. He bought a hot tub, bought some shoes, bought oh something God. else. $49,000 worth of purchases. 49000 But But the point is, it all is it tracked. Happens. And it, it goes with, yes. it, yep. it happens because you don't analyze oh, the you. data right. on a regular basis to identify variations in spending. And if I may... Um, the incident in Sarasota, the individuals from the NIGP, the National Institute, they came in and revamped our purchasing at that time. We brought them in, and they've been back several times to monitor us to get us to best practices so that we don't end up that way. So, and that was as recent a year ago. That's right. We, I mean, we've, yeah. we've been the NIGP AEP, which is the... Um, the award of excellence in procurement award winner for the last seven years. Yeah, and, and so. I, I will tell you, I will tell you, a couple of weeks ago, nearly every person except for maybe me on the ninth floor had their P cards turned off because the reporting wasn't done on time. Mine so, off. yeah, no, I don't mess. <laughs> <laughs> I never use it. No, no, it, it was, it was. I mean, there was a miscommunication, but the fact of the matter is, the P cards all got turned off because the 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 reporting wasn't done in a timely fashion so um i am not going to mess around with that kind of stuff so wow okay well we we probably I'm, I'm sorry i probably opened a hornet's nest but i mean that's you know it's pretty important um yes. and i i do before i i call on commissioner servia who's waiting patiently over there um the other thing that i want to add is that i know that there's nothing left for a state of emergency for Manatee County. There's, uh, I've checked with the state. There isn't anything. There's no special funding that we get because of it. Uh, we don't get any more vaccines because of it. We've already got the, the CARES Act money. We, you know, we've got everything. So all it does is leave us in a state of emergency situation, particularly with P cards. Mm -hmm. So um, Mr. County Administrator and Mr. County Attorney, you know, I'm going to ask that we discuss that in our next meeting because that's something we really need to look at. It, it's really a shell of an order on the state level. And if you talk to any of your legislators or anybody in the governor's office, they're going to tell you the same because I have. We'll, 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 so, we'll look at what the options are, the, the, the benefits and the risks. Yeah, there are no benefits to it at this point from what I have been told from Tallahassee. Okay. We'll, Commissioner we'll Servia. Uh, just a couple of comments about the P cards, and I don't want to add steam to the conspiracy theories about the hot tubs that are purchased and what could happen. Talk we, to Port of Tampa. We, Their CEO can tell you. We, there, are, there's our, there are those instances, but um, I, I think we will all agree as commissioners, uh, and those of us who have been on longer have more experiences. Vanessa probably has way more, but um, if you pay tax at a hotel on your P card. You're going to have three people in your office on Monday going $4. Yeah, but you're, you're a commissioner. <laughs> yeah, so... You don't know how it is elsewhere. No, I, 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 I can would say if that. they're coming after my tax, they're coming after everybody's. Trust so me, I make sure it's I, I think I, I, it's very highly regulated, as it should be. And it's audited very... There's a lot of scrutiny that goes into it. So... Yes, there are the occasions when somebody buys a hot tub because 
they doctor their invoice. But I would say the one off that, that that's She's that doesn't always happen. A positive. It doesn't happen very often. I just don't want to fuel a bunch of discussion that isn't necessary. You know what I mean? Let's talk about it. But it, that that really is the unique sure. situation. And, and, Steve, no one's can, making accusations. I only ask for it I, to be looked I, I at. Really I'm not Kevin and stuff. So I, I can I can assure all of you. Regardless of your <laughs> level within the ed, or within the county, from a P card standpoint, everybody's the same. Yeah. We can't. There's no delineation between again county commissioners or a field tech out at the beach who is helping pick up garbage. Uh, they're they're just they're just they're, they're it is it's it's a program that needs immense amount of control and we mm -hmm. have those controls in place. Yeah, fifty thousand per transaction. Yeah, I'd say so. During a state of emergency. Ooh. Yeah, well, there only. You go. Then it resorts back to twenty five hundred. Good. Yep. Big difference. Uh, please send out the uh, notice for the commissioners to go through their P card training. Actually, conveniently, it's, it's very online beneficial. now. They would so learn we, a lot from so it. So we have made it. We have made it virtual, so you can take it at your computer should you choose. I've been around too long. I know the rules. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the only, since we are on P cards, whether we like it or not, uh, the story that I know and have heard was exactly what you referred to. In that, uh, someone was high up in an organization, relatively high up in a school board. And they purchased a little bit over time, over time, over time, until it was over a year worth of buying grills and whatever else. And when they went to go look for that property, it was all at their house. Um, that was oh. that was not here. Uh, was yeah. a long way from here. And let me just say to the citizens at home, um, I did go through the training. I think. <laughs> and, yeah. and when we did, uh, first of all, once they go through all the rules, you're like, huh, so I could basically never use this thing, right? So there's basically no call for us, at least, for a commissioner, at least, uh, to use it unless you're traveling, and then it's still very specific. Um, and then the very, you know, right away, the uh, what an executive assistant, the executive assistant is like, <laughs> put out her hand and and she has my p card i haven't seen it since so uh and that's fine with me so. and, and i would i would be remiss to to also mention that that accounts payable the finance department angels yeah. angels crew over there they do a pre-audit of all of the p card transactions for the month and then they do a final audit once all the documentation comes in so that happens on a monthly basis of which if there's anything that looks peculiar or you know could be considered a split transaction if we don't if we don't flag it immediately when we're reviewing it on a, on a monthly basis ap catches it and then they go back and they require the necessary justification or rationale as to why that purchase was made so that we do go through a lot of there is there is a monthly auditing chain based on everything that is spent on a p card a lot of controls okay i'm gonna go ahead with everyone's permission um and open this to public comment i have one card <laughs> Andra Griffin. Okay. Well, I haven't gone to that yet. That's next. You're, you're what? Oh, no. Andra Griffin, Manatee County. So um, I, a lot of the questions I have have been answered. Um, one of the things was um, what are put in place uh, to make sure that county business um, opportunities are provided to Manatee County, which I think several people had brought that up. Um, I disagree with Misty's position on this because even if we pay a little bit more to have a, a Bradenton or Manatee County business here, they're spending that money back in taxes, uh, you know, using our roads, filling up with gas, buying supplies. So I wouldn't mind spending a little more money to keep that money here. Um, I... <laughs> I had a different experience whenever I was younger because my father was a master electrician. So th the idea that these things don't happen is untrue. Um, I remember I can name off several instances um, of contract awarding for him. So um, I, I'm not saying that this is 20, 30 years ago when the good old boys club was here, but I mean, I just can't imagine that all this just goes away. I'm very concerned that we have um, bureaucrats being able to spend $50,000 um, and nobody can give us their names. Who has the, who's able to do this? Um, I'm also concerned about $500,000 being um, able, you guys can just write a check. There, 
That's that's unacceptable. To, I, I don't need you to ex, to to comment. Uh, I'm just telling you my comments. That's unacceptable to me as a taxpayer. I mean, this is why we we have a board here. This is why we pay these people money. Um, and then just as, and I'm not coming down on you, Jacob, but just a um, just as uh, a little bit of constructive criticism. Um, your presentation was very good and thoughtful. You know the information. You didn't convey that information to, to me, a taxpayer, that was understandable and easy for me to follow. So I, I would just ask you to just adjust a little bit of your presentation so it's, it's more digestible for somebody like me. Um, uh, lastly, um, I wanted to thank Scott Hopes for doing the right thing last night um, and uh, actually defying his own rules in a meeting. So kudos to you. Welcome to the basket of deplorables. My card must have got lost. Glenn Giblin, for the record, thank you so much. Good presentation. Uh, so on the design build, when that comes to you, uh, does that come from an architect or a builder? So let's just, so I'm kind of confused of, of where, how that gets to you. And the reason I ask is that everything that you procure, from the pencils to this room to the aggregate and the roads, uh, you know, is there a return of investment? There isn't. So when you get a procurement, and there's not a solar renewable energy component in it, I'm concerned. So when it gets to you and it's not there, are there any red flags to go up? And if not, you know, I'm just trying to do, figure out the process of why the library doesn't have solar. Why don't we have a solar farm and just say, put it out for bid and see what the return would be? Could that, could that, could that be happen? I mean, that's just a question. The other thing I want to say is local bids, uh, I, I would go for that as well. Now on the, I went to your website by the way, and I, and I pulled up the public meetings that you have. You Zoom them, right? Yes. Yes. Right. So there was one of the Zoom meetings there where you had five, five things. You had two first evaluations, mm -hmm. two second evaluations, you had a final, then you had an interview which is private, right? And then you have the final. On, on the two, two first evaluations, you canceled one. Yes, sir. On the two second evaluations, you had canceled one. Mm -hmm. No, you canceled both. Correct. You to collect reschedule. both, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to get the Zoom on the first one, and it's taken down. So as a public and a taxpayer that's trying to get this information... How would I get that information if you don't archive the Zooms, you don't even have a second evaluation, your interviews are on private, and then we get the final contract. So um, where's the missing middle to the taxpayer like me where I can go back at, at, you know, at my own house and Zoom on that meeting and take a look at it? I just feel shortchanged. Maybe you can tweak it. Maybe you can archive the Zooms. But I think if you're not there at that Zoom meeting, you're left out. And then when you try to go to the Zoom meeting, you canceled, it's not there. And there's no second evaluations. So those evaluation committee, me committee meetings, you're more than welcome to attend them in person as well. We encourage it. I think this, this one goes back during COVID. I don't think you, anyone was allowed. And that's to. what kind of, yeah, that kind of threw us for a loop. Okay. All right. Great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else from the public want to come forward? Don't think so. Seth, no phone calls? All right, then I'm going to close public comment. So I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for being here with us. Jake, good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, we already adjourned. I am so sorry. I, you know what? Let me reopen this meeting. Okay. I just reopened the meeting. No, I, I so. Kevin did ask me, and I forgot. Yeah, just a few things. Few things I want to cover, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, I have achieved a scheduled meeting with the Mayor of Holmes Beach um, on June seventh at eight thirty in the morning. Um, Administrator Hopes and myself will meet with the Mayor and the Holmes Beach Traffic Engineer, uh, Chief Tokajar. Um, so yeah, so it's a good first step, I think. Hopefully, it'll be a good icebreaker. Looking forward to it. Um, real quick, either Commissioner Satcher or Commissioner Bellamy's uh, constituent, Tanaya Parker. Uh, she went into Commissioner Serbia's district to Speedy's 
uh, on 57th, and she purchased a scratch off a couple weeks ago. She won $2 million. Man. Yes. Nice. So, yeah, a little bit of good news. I'm headed to Speedy's after this. <laughs> so, well, yeah, though so they get four, they get four grand in commission for that. Um, I did email all of you. Um, that we discussed it at the uh, MPO. The Cortez Bridge Aesthetics Committee is this is sort of coming to shape, and, and we're getting a good idea of what the bridge is going to look like. And there were probably a dozen or more renderings in the email that I send you all in that package, just so you all have an idea of the direction the bridge is going, and you can, of course, share it with your constituents if you choose as well. I did see on Facebook something about from utilities about conserving water because we are extremely dry. Um, so by all means, spread the word on that. And there is a meeting tomorrow with the Fire Chiefs Association to determine whether or not a burn ban is necessary. Ultimately, Jake Sauer has the final say on that. But if they de decide, I'm not an expert, if they decide it's not necessary, hopefully they will start meeting with, you know, a lot more frequency because it's been over a month since we had measurable rain. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We might need a state of emergency. Yes, Just sir. a quick note on the water situation. <laughs> it's it's not because we have a shortage of water. It's because we're undergoing some equipment replacement, and normally we have a little bit more. Uh, so that's, uh, it's a temporary situation. Thank you. Um Mr. Cruz, did you, Commissioner Cruz, did you have something to add, sir? Yeah, I was going to add to the water thing, too. I was actually on the phone with a commissioner from Sarasota at 1030 last night because they get some of their water from us, so we actually cut back on the water we were sending to them, so they were having some North County issues with water pressure. Uh, it, it, it got fixed first thing this morning. I actually met with the executive director of Peace River this morning to discuss it. Peace River's more than fine. They actually, they were pulling out of the, the river way later in the year than they even usually do because there was so much water. All the reserves there are full. Uh, so, so they can backstop Sarasota if necessary. But we don't need to. As of 6.30 this morning, we re-increased what we were sitting on Sarasota. They're fully on on full speed. They're, they're 5 million gallons per day they get from us. So th there's no real meaningful issue. I think that's an abundance of caution. Listen to the abundance of caution, but we're going into our, well, I'm saying we're, 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 we've got the water. But we, I don't want to, we, wait, we, do, are, we are, do need, are, we do need people to conserve. Okay. We do need people to conserve where they can I, and just follow our water guidelines. Understood that, that, but that's standard practice at all. I just want to make sure people are understanding that we, our reservoirs and dry it's not. Yes. Uh, because, well, because it was all around Sarasota, and I don't want have to get the water I processed sure out of the reservoir. People, and it was two all over Sarasota sauces, so. that they had no water pressure and they weren't getting water. I wanted to make sure people understood we were not from Sarasota. It was a different situation down there. It, Is Al Mayo it, still the chair of Peace River? Yes. It's it's the people we've become. It's gasoline. It's toilet paper. It's water. People need to just relax. There's plenty of everything. <laughs> Water, water your lawn with gasoline if necessary. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Satcher, did you have something to add, sir? You're holding your card. <laughs> um, I can only it, imagine. It might be a question for Commissioner Cruz since you had the conversation. How long, because I saw the post from Sarasota County government, how long was their supply of water that they would normally get from us cut off or cut down? Do you know? No, the email from Sarasota Utilities to the commissioners just went out yesterday morning, like 1030 in the morning. So I'm guessing not very long because they didn't alert their other commissioners until then. It, the people that were affected were strictly North County. So basically, Bee Ridge to University. And that's because the pipes from Peace River, much further away... They're just, they don't have the capacity to get all the way up there with meaningful water pressure. So North County utilizes more of the, the current contract with Manatee County, the 5 million gallons per day we keep sending down there through 2025. So they're, they're full pressure. We dropped them from 5 million gallons to, I think it was about 3.2 million gallons. That was still providing enough water. We hit the minimum threshold where they were getting the, the legally necessary amount of water, but it was obviously causing water. It was going from like 100 pounds to 20. And so, if, especially if you're on the second floor, third floor is my understanding of an apartment building, you were getting virtually no water pressure. But again, that happened. I, they alerted everyone yesterday morning. By 6.30 this morning, we were full capacity back down to Sarasota.
So have a great Memorial Day. Be ready to get back to work come Tuesday. I'll be here tomorrow. This is an apartment. I have appointments out of the office all day. Would you like to see my calendar? Actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to use my P card. Get away. This meeting's a